Good evening to round three. And we hope it's the final round. At this point, you all know the, the rules, the bounds of the hall, and so on. Uh, because we have about 15 articles to get through this evening in order to conclude town meeting, we're going to try to stick, uh, adhere to the rules, three, three minutes for the presenters, two minutes for other speakers, with extensions allowed on occasion by the moderator. When you come to the mic, it would be helpful for me and for the, the other um, citizens who are participating in town meeting, start your comments by, I rise to support the article, I rise to speak against the article, and then state your reasons. The more uh, concise and brief you are, the more impact your statements will have. With that, Ms. Kramer, Article 39, Temporary Banners. Article 39, ooh, wow. Uh, we move that the town vote to amend the zoning bylaws of the town of Hopkinton as set forth in Article 39 of Annual Town Meeting Warrant. The Planning Board held a public hearing on the proposal on February 25th, 2019. The Board voted on February 25th, 2019 to recommend that the town meeting adopt the change. If I could have the slide 13. So this, uh, this is a, an article about temporary banners. It adds streets where temporary banners can be displayed. Um, so the streets that temporary banners can now be displayed are Route 85, Route 135, and West Main Street. Previously, it was only uh, Main Street. This allows for flexibility with re respect to where banners can be displayed, but there are limitations due to the location of utility poles. So someday we may not have utility poles at Main Street. Uh, we, incre we, we allow for the, in this article, if it passes, allows for the increase of the maximum size of banners <coughs> from 75 square feet to 180 square feet. Apparently we have been uh, not in accordance with the law a t number of times. Um, and the Board of Selectmen will continue to approve all banners over the streets. This would still be required. Any questions? This feels like a unanimous vote in one direction or the other. All those in favor of Article 39 signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? And it's unanimous and so voted. Article 40, Ms. Kramer. Article 40, commercial solar photovoltaic installations. We move that the town vote to amend the zoning bylaws of the town of Hopkinton as set forth in Article 40 of the annual town meeting warrant. The planning board held a public hearing on the proposal on February 25th, March 25th, and April 8th. The board voted on April 8th to recommend to the town meeting to adopt the change. So if I can have slide 15. Look at that. Um, so this adds language to strengthen the planning board's ability to require screening of solar farms that are um, abutting residential properties in particular. The planning board has learned through experience um, that this is a challenging issue and we needed a, a little bit more uh, teeth in the bylaw in order to protect residences from abutting commercial uses. On my left. Mr. Moderator Mark Hyman, 12 Hidden Brick. Um, I stand to offer an amendment. Please go ahead. Uh, Josh, I believe, has it in the back. Um, what I'm proposing is to amend the article by adding um, from abutting properties in public ways um, in terms of what has to be screened. And I can walk through the reasons once that's up. So thank you, Josh. I, I appreciate what the planning board is trying to do with this article. I think um, few of us would be happy if a large commercial solar project were to be proposed for our neighborhood. Um, unfortunately, the planning board and, and the ZBA have been um, in the past between a rock and a hard place because it's, you know, it, we've had to approve problematic projects because the state law only allows local regulation of solar uses for three reasons, public health, safety, and welfare. Um, the state's guidance on zoning for solar specifically calls out aesthetic limitations like screening and says that those are problematic unless solar is held to the same level of restriction as other uses. 
So our current bylaws have site plan standards that are applicable to other commercial projects, uh, section 136.1 F, um, and those require that exposed machinery, which seems to be the closest um, approach to solar panels, um, must be visually screened, but only from abutting properties and public ways. So my proposed amendment puts this article closer to what our existing standards are for other uses. And I think the, the concern I have here is that while the planning board is, is trying to give themselves more teeth and more flexibility in dealing with problematic projects, if we put a bylaw in that um, expressly is different for solar and more restrictive for solar than it is for anything else, then on its face, developers are going to know that they'll be able to challenge it and win. So we're never going to be able to enforce an, a, a condition on the, that ground. So I, I, I entirely applaud the desire and the, and the approach. What I'm proposing is to give it a little more boundaries um, so that it's more likely to be upheld. Um, I'll also note, although town council can speak to it, um, when he reviewed this, he indicated that there was a bit of lack of specificity in terms of what had to be shielded as well and from whom. Um, I, I think this would address that concern as well. Okay. Is there a second? Second. <clears throat> Is there any discussion on the amendment that's being proposed? Uh, I think it's, do you have a question? Uh, William Simpson, five Constitution Court. Um, solar panels are the best way to produce electricity we have yet, but why tear down solar systems that are much better than anything man-made, namely trees? Uh, Instead of putting it on a <clears throat> woods, why that's, not put it on top of a roof? Uh, Mr. Simpson, around? that's outside of the scope of this, amend this particular discussion. Oh, it is. Okay. <clears throat> is there any, dis any further discussion on the amendment? Okay, seeing, seeing that there is no further discussion, we'll vote on the amendment. All those in favor of the amendments signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? And it's a clear majority. Thank you. So now we go back to a discussion on the motion as amended. Is there any further discussion on the motion as amended? Okay, seeing none. And this, this requires a two-thirds majority as a zoning article. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? And it's unanimous and so voted. Muriel, can you just make sure that after it says zoning bylaws, they take away by deleting the third and fourth sentences? It doesn't belong in there? Um, I don't know what you're asking, Darlene. Do you read it by deleting the third and fourth sentences? Well, it's the way, it's what we just voted, so it better be right. Well, we can, um, if, there's a, if there's a technical problem, we can still reconsider this evening. So why don't you take a look at it, and if we need to reconsider, we can come back to it. Um, you know, that is what's in the article. Um, so. It changes the language. It, the town council indicates it's correct the way it is. Okay. So let's move on to Article 41. Citizens Petition, Subdivision, Garden Apartment, Village Housing, Phasing. Uh, we have a slideshow. Uh, good evening. My name is Amy Ritterbush from 54 Grove Street, and this is... Um, I'm Deborah Feinberg from 12 Prestwick Drive, speaking as a citizen. Okay. And we are the authors of two citizens' petitions to shape residential growth. Uh, the first one is Article 41, uh, the Subdivision Phasing and Guardian Department Bylaw, and we would like to... Um, make a motion for no action on Article 41 so that we can have more discussion on Article 42. So we'd like to make the motion as written in the, mo in the, warrant docu in the motions document. Second. Second. Okay, uh, Muriel? 
So uh, this article was not reviewed by the Zoning Advisory Committee. The Planning Board um, did take a vote and did, do not support the article. So by extension, we would support the motion for no action. Okay, so effectively the petitioners are asking that this motion uh, in, in uh, layman's terms be withdrawn. Is there any discussion with respect to the withdrawal of this motion? Seeing none, all those in favor of taking no action on Article 41 signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay, and so the, the uh, article fails. Article 42, once again, please um, move the motion. Uh, any Excuse me, the, vo the motion passes, the article fails. Okay. Yeah. Amy Ritterbush, 54 Grove Street. I would like to move Article 42 as written in the motions document. And is there a second? Second. Okay. Please go ahead. Okay, thanks. Okay, so uh, just to give a brief statement, the reason we moved, removed Article 41 is that after submitting it, we realized it would not, um, it would not really do what we had intended, and that's why we, we decided to try to remove it. Okay, but we'd like to go ahead and um, with Article 42, um, if we could have, I believe it, it's slide four. While you're getting the slide up, I, I've neglected to ask Muriel to uh, indicate whether the planning board had recommended this article. So this article was not reviewed by the Zoning Advisory Committee, <clears throat> and this article was heard by the planning board, and we voted not to support this article. Thank you. Could we have slide four? <clears throat> Okay, so Article 42 would imp implement a temporary cap until June 30th, 2020 on the construction of new residential dwelling units in town. It would also require the town to establish a growth study committee no later than August 1st, 2019. And during the temporary moratorium, a, to a townwide total of not more than 12 building permits for new residential dwelling units will not be allowed. Any one applicant would not be allowed to build more than two dwelling units during the temporary moratorium. Um, slide five. There are some exemptions to the temporary moratorium, such as commercial developments would not be affected, they would still be encouraged during the moratorium. The enlargement, restoration, alteration, or reconstruction of existing dwelling units would not be affected. Permits already issued prior to the town meeting vote would also not be affected. And the Osmod Zoning District, which is known as Legacy Farms, would also not be affected per town council. Um, number six, slide six. All right. So um, why do we want to do this? Uh, the biggest concern we hear from members of the public is that Hopkinton is growing too quickly and town services are becoming strained as they struggle to catch up. The residents are hungry for discussion on this topic and we hope that by bringing this article forward to town meeting, we will allow for that important conversation to come to being. And in adopting the article, we can, next slide, um, we would hope the town can better plan for school capacity, fire emergency services, traffic, DPW and highway needs water, sewer, and other municipal needs. And I'll just go through quickly these last slides because I think you've seen them before if you were here yesterday or Monday. So slide eight is the number of building permits issued per year for the last 30 years, and you can see the large spike in the last few years. Slide nine shows the fire department effective response force trends for the last three years, and you can see that the response times are increasing. Uh, slide 10 shows enrollment data for anticipated school enrollment in recent years, which I know we've seen earlier. Uh, slide 11 shows some of the costs of addressing increased enrollment. And slide 12 shows new home productions for FY19 and 20. So in closing, we're looking forward to a respectful discussion tonight. Um, and we'll be happy to answer questions. Ms. Kramer. You know, Kramer, 39 North Street, speaking as a resident, not, not a member of the planning board, I rise to oppose this article. Um, I have a couple of questions. Um, first of all, do your slides tease out the numbers of students, for example, that would be part of the growth projections from Legacy Farms, which is not affected, and other development? They, I don't think that they do. No. I think if we could move back to slide four, from, that could be good for now. The school committee slide was with respect to all new incoming students. Correct. And, and it's not. Do you have other questions, Muriel? Oh, I do. Please. <laughs> Minute and a half left. Yeah. 
Um, I wonder, you spoke about all the town departments that are going to be affected by this, the, uh, that are affected by the growth. Did you get buy-in from any of those uh, town departments or committees um, that, are, that are potentially wrapped into this effort, for this effort, before this meeting? We did not get formal buy-in, but we did speak with them. Uh, I'm keenly interested why members of the planning board did not use the planning board process when proposing a zoning article. Uh, outside of the scope. That's okay. So um, the planning board voted not to support this article, and it, uh, it's never been brought forward to the Zoning Advisory Committee for review. As, as all zoning articles should be, we know that the Chamber of Commerce does not support it. They wrote a very thoughtful piece. I hope people have taken the time to review that. There's a process in place for a reason, and this is a very complicated discussion. So while I don't support this approach, I certainly do support the conversation. Um, and I think it's worth saying that the planning board um, immediately stepped in to, uh, to organize a thoughtful approach. And we are already have a meeting scheduled for the, the end of May. Um, and we hope to involve all stakeholders and constituency groups in that conversation. I think it's important to know that I, we, I, we do need to know, we really do need to know, we have to have a solid number of the number of units that would be affected without Legacy Farms, because that's what we're voting on. Thank you, Muriel. On my right. Shannon Riley for Clydesdale Lane. Um, I'm also rising uh, to oppose this article for, um, not for its intent, but for the way it's structured. Um, um, you folks obviously marshaled your arguments and your statistics to put this forth, but I think that the idea of, it's just incomplete. I mean, you talk about a growth study committee, well, what, what is it supposed to do and how is it supposed to do it? And why 12 permits a year? Is that one a month or all at once? Um, and so it's really the, the actuality, the implementation of this is not very well thought through. Um, despite your passion for the for the subject, um, uh, so that's uh, that's why I oppose it. The the one last thing is the fact that these any kind of moratorium or caps or anything arbitrary like that on a real estate market is going to impact the market in the long run. So while you may, if this were to pass, you may limit them to 12 to 12 um, uh, home building permits one year, the next year you may get double what you otherwise would have because folks are going to wait until the moratorium is over. Thank you. On my left, Mr. Hyman. Did you want me to respond about the number? Or uh, go ahead. Yeah. I was going to say, we chose the number 12 because this is modeled on a bylaw from the town of Northfield, which limited it to num the number of six, and Hoppington is about twice the size as North <clears throat> Northfield. And the permits would be issued um, on a first come, first serve basis. Mr. Hyman. Mark Wait, Hyman, I'm 12 Hidden Brick. Um, I, I rise. Wait a second. Uh, we were done with a response. I was going to jump in and make a response to Muriel. Go ahead. Wait. Never, um, from, from our data, we have um, a total of 31, approximately 31 homes that will be built. So the 12, subtracting the 12 that would be allowable, um, two, it's in, it's in the proposal. Two would be um, from each contractor, from uh, six different contractors. This would, be, thus, this would be affecting only 19 homes. And now, Mr. Hyman. Thank you. Um, I rise to speak against this article as it's drafted. Um, while I think most of the town is concerned about appropriately managing all the growth that's been happening in town, uh, it is a, is a double-edged sword. It's a, a benefit and an opportunity. Um, I think I, there are two main issues with this. Um, the proposed article breaks out a, st a growth study committee and puts in a moratorium. With respect to the growth study committee, my concern is that what it's proposing to do seems to overlap, if not, if not substantially overtake, the role of the planning board. Um, planning boards are supposed to plan for the future growth, development, and preservation of a community's resources. And I, I would question uh, the, uh, the proponents here, are the, is this growth study committee supposed to work in tandem with the planning board or is it supposed to take over under this bylaw those responsibilities? Um, 
secondly the idea with setting a limit of twelve building permits which is substantially lower than we would expect is going to effectively mean that there's going to be a rush to the office once this article would be signed off by the attorney general i think that's probably going to add vantage big you know big developers or landowners who are appropriately ready to do that to the detriment of other members of the town who may be wanting to to uh... to put a building permit together but can't have all the resources ready to go on day one so thank you thank you on my right it's up go ahead it's up to you um, so the reason for the growth study committee is that you cannot have a moratorium without also establishing a planning process that you need to undertake during the moratorium and uh, let's see and the the rush my understanding is if when this are if this article passes it takes effect immediately not when the attorney general approves it but we could ask town council Is that the case? <laughs> attorney Mieris when the attorney general approves the zoning change it becomes effective retroactive to the date that town meeting voted. Thank you. On my right. Leah Butler Rafferty, Five Meadowland Drive, member of the Board of Assessors, but speaking as myself, a private citizen. Um, I just, I, I know I've already brought this up to Amy, so this is not about pro or con, it's more just informational. Uh, we've been talking about maximum tax levies, restricting new growth, um, affects the maximum tax levy for the following year, right? And we're already talking about an underwrite. So if people are thinking about voting for the underwrite when it appears in the election, this might actually um, further restrict us. And if there's an issue within town that we need to get more money into our coffers from, we won't be able to. And so this is something to consider. If you're pro underwrite, this may not be a good idea. If you're pro this, then the underwrite may not be a good idea. So think about that when you're making a decision. Thank you. On my left. Brian Douglas, 14 Greenwood Road. Uh, so I rise strongly against this article. Um, this article makes the assumption that the planning board and our government can't walk and chew gum at the same time, i.e. Uh, grow a community and also address that growth. Um, what I'm hearing tonight is that we want to take an action, a moratorium if you will, without actually studying the impact of that action. It's like a ready, fire, aim approach in my opinion. Um, so I would ask, you know, did we project the impact on future taxes? What about impact on future home prices? Did we make any assumptions on the impacts to our future budgets? What about the message that it sends to the real estate market or to young families like mine who just moved to Hopkinton recently that find it a desirable place to live for all the reasons we mentioned over the past couple of nights? Um, also, being this is a third night of three for me, um, over the past two days we voted to cap or exempt taxes for certain groups of people, which I'm absolutely in favor for. Uh, we voted to spend millions of dollars on capital equipment uh, and on dog parks. Uh, fire chief got a new ladder truck. Uh, you know, we heard the pension fund and future obligations are underfunded compared to our outline goals. And now we want to arbitrarily stop that growth. So I, I can tell you what that's going to do because we've seen it happen in other cities and towns across the country. It's going to raise our taxes. Uh, it's going to raise our home prices. It's going to make it more difficult for our seniors to afford to stay in their homes. Uh, and it's going to more, make it more difficult for people who want to come to Hopkinton for all the reasons that we find it a great place to live. It's gonna make it more difficult to come here. So I, I, again, I rise against this article. Thank you. On my right. Uh, Michael and Holmes, 5 Holt Street. And I am a senior and I live on a busy street and uh, with a lot of traffic. Um, I am opposed to, to the uh, rapidity with which this is done. You'll barely get the growth study in place, you'll confuse the builders, you'll confuse homeowners. <clears throat> I think it's a, I don't think it's, com I really love pure democracy, I brag about it all the time. <laughs> I don't think this is that. On my left. 
Mary Arnott, 51 Teresa Road, where I applaud uh, you both and the, those people that support you for trying to find a solution to get a better handle on planning and controlling growth. I do have to rise in opposition to this article uh, for many of the reasons that have already been stated, but I also don't know how it might impact if we need to build affordable housing. Uh, how does that play into it? So I would encourage you to go back and look at this again, work with the different boards, and perhaps come up with a solution that the town could accept on how to plan and better control its growth. Thank you. Clay Wright, 28. Wait, oh, hold oh, on, there's a response. Yeah. My, response to, my response to Mary, respectfully, is that um, as far as um, restoration, one-to-one um, -one building, the building inspector would take it in case-by-case -case scenario. And so it wouldn't be doing anything to that. Oh, no, and, no. and well, some of that is what affordable housing is doing and some of the fixes that we need for units that are left isolated. On my right. Claire Wright, 28 Hayden Row. And speaking as a member of the Board of Selectmen, um, we are, of course, very pleased that we've been able to keep the overall tax impact to taxpayers this year at 2.5%. But I must point out, whether you love or hate new growth, the actual overall change in the tax levy was 5.12%. 2.93% was covered by new growth. So more than half, and that large cushion that has protected the taxpayers from large tax increases is the result of the new growth. On my left. Um, no. Mike Shepard, 11 Hill Street. I, I rise in opposition to this uh, article. Um, I, I applaud the ladies for the gumption to get up and the courage to try to do something. However, I think it's misplaced in this case. Uh, we don't restrict the pizza guy to the number of pizzas he can make. We don't restrict the gas station to the amount of gas he can sell. Why would we restrict a builder to the amount of buildings he can build? It's, it's, it's unfair. For every one of these builders who are nameless and are making a fortune, there's a truck driver, there's a guy that drives an excavator, there's a foundation guy, a plumber, <clears throat> an electrician, all of whom will lose jobs. And nobody, particularly members of the planning board, should have any shock over the amount of building that's going on now. I did the Osmond thing 15 years ago when I sat on the Board of Selectmen. I knew it was going to happen. You should have known it was going to happen. And the point is well taken. We're making more in taxes off of these houses than the, this part of it. So again, I, you know, I, I think it's wrong to, to isolate one single segment of society and say you can't do this anymore until we get our head out of our butts to try to figure out how to fix it. Now, you should be fixing it now while you're on the planning board. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Did you um, ladies have a response to a comment from Claire Wright? Hang, hang on just a second. I don't think we should. Let's I'm not convinced. I don't have the complete figures um, as far as the tax rates, but from the 1995 study, which does need to be updated, we've done only two studies on this development, on, on our development crisis. Um, one was done in 1995, which was, was a very good numbers-to-numbers um, -numbers study. The one in 2007 was a little bit more catered to the developer and why the developer should come to Hopkinton. So the numbers were a little fuzzy and they were warm. What I'd like to do is to find a combination of that. But in response to the taxes, we're only talking 19 homes. We're talking there's still going to be 120, um, 120 to 150 homes in the Osma district. We're talking about 12 homes overall built. And um, I feel that we're all thankful I mean, I, I live in a development. I live in a home that was struggle in that uh, uh, neighborhood that was struggle that had to struggle um, with the rights to build as well. It took 15 years to do, to develop Prestwick Drive, um, and I think that that th there are some significant hurdles. But I think what we are lacking in our um, zoning in our zoning bylaws is a phased approach 
and it's distinct, distinctly made aware to me by talking with, with um, people from, from Stowe and people from um, Bolton who have, have um, found methods in their zoning bylaws that regulate like one to 35 homes per year, um, 35 to 65 homes per year. So they actually have it in their zoning bylaws as to, to what would be an appreciable amount so that the schools aren't caught unaware, so that the fire department can make sure he gets his equipment in time and can race to a fire in, in the appropriate time. Um, there, granted, there are lots of factors going into it. Um, I am not a tax person, but from that 1995 study, the, the services that go into um, um, helping a town survive um, are more costly than what the tax rate brings in. And, and those are out, out for study. Until we get those numbers, we don't know. Um. You know, at this point, we've heard a lot of uh, people speaking against the article. Is there anyone who wants to rise to speak in favor of the article? Okay, on my right. Uh, Rebecca Hoffman, 12 Mount Auburn Street. I want to call attention to um, a, a section in here that says analysis of whether or not there was an overall net positive financial impact. And I think that that's a worthwhile study to be done. I'm um, backing up what Deborah just said, that we don't really know that. And there are, are various studies in various communities about what the cost is of new growth. And I think a moratorium and the ability to study that uh, in, in, a, in, in a slower fashion and a group that's committed to doing that is a really, really good idea. So thank you for bringing this forward. Is there anyone else who would like to speak in favor of the article? Um, Ken Parker, 69 Clinton Street. Um, I got to admit I'm of two minds a little bit on supporting this argument. However, I'd like to counter some of the uh, arguments that it's a bad idea. So uh, the argument that we can't afford it because we've got so much money coming in from new growth is an argument to never stop growing. And, and presumably after we want, uh, if that argument were true, after we ran out of land, that argument would imply that we ought to change our zoning laws in order to continue to grow by other means so that we would continue to have new revenue coming in. So I'd just like to make the point that that can't hold forever. Maybe it can hold in the short term. And uh, 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 the other point I'd like to make is there's got to be some way that we can accomplish these ends. I, I would uh, certainly think it ought to work better if the planning board did have the, the full opportunity to review it and for Zach to do that. But it's, we've got to do something somehow. And this is a, a good first step. It will only apply for a year. And so I don't see that there's that much damage to, to voting for it. Any, any other comments in favor? Mr. Weissmantle? Ken Weissmantle, 145 Ash Street. I rise strongly in opposition to this uh, article. I've lived in Hopkinton since 81. I experienced the, the big growth in that we thought was huge in the middle of 80s. And, kind of sat here in town meeting and did kind of what they did right now. And then I lived through the 90s where we had 40% increase in the number of dwellings in that decade. And I'll tell you, the 90s was tough. We didn't have enough money to run the town. We were override, over override. We built addition to center school and rehab to Elmwood School and the middle school, mm -hmm. high school, and then the high school and Hopkins, all these schools. We're not in that situation anywhere close. We have good management in town that's planning for our future. We have a school committee that is exceptionally, providing exceptionally good schooling. That isn't, wasn't the case in the 90s either. We had problems in the 90s. That's when all, a lot of you folks built your big four bedroom home and came here, you know, on, and the rest of Hopkinton and you put three kids through the schools and you made it worse. Legacy Farms, we plan that. It's mostly two bedroom, it's bedroom limited. That's why you're not seeing the financial impact that you're seeing. 
we did the studies for, for legacy farms, and the numbers are better than what was advertised at the time. This is not needed. We really don't need to upset the, a well-run town with a great bond rating and great financial to the point where we're voting on our third underride shortly. Thank you. Thank you. On my right. Carol Dever, 47 Chamberlain Street. I'd like to move the question. Is there a second? OK. So there's a motion to end debate on this article. All those in favor of ending debate signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? OK. So we're ready for a vote on Article 42. All those in favor of Article 42 one-year growth restriction signify by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed? No. OK. It clearly fails because it needed a two-thirds majority. Article 43, Citizens Petition, Change Board of Selectmen to Select Board. Amy Groves. Oh, we do have some slides for this. They're the green and yellow ones. Thank you, Mr. Moderator, and hello, town meeting. I'm Amy Groves from Two College Street, and I'm the author of the Citizens' Petition for Articles 43 and 44. I'm going to start, I move, by, I move Article 43 as written. Second. And uh, Ms. Kramer, do you have a, a planning board recommendation? I do. Uh, the, the planning board held a public hearing on the proposal on February 25th and March 25th and voted on March 25th to support this change. And just to clarify, this is a change to the zoning bylaw, which is why the planning board is involved. Okay. Back to you, Amy. So I have moved Article 43 as written because I can only move one article at a time. Uh, but with prior permission from the moderator, I will save us all some time, and I will run through both articles at the same time. That's because, in essence, their flow is exactly the same. There's one chief difference between them, and that is Article 43 pertains to the zoning bylaws, so it will require a two-thirds majority vote to pass. Article 44 is for the general bylaws, so that's just a simple majority. So two votes means uh, two articles. Next slide, please. So what do these articles do? It's very simple. We propose to change in the bylaws the term Board of Selectmen to Select Board. In essence, that's it. Uh, in some cases, as we see currently, the bylaws also refer to simply the select men. In those cases, the bylaws intend that to mean the Board of Select Men. So at the advice of town council, we're also changing that to select board, just for a little consistency and cleanup. We also propose to make these wording changes to any new articles or new wording that are introduced in this multi-session town meeting. That's so people don't have to run around changing their wording at the last minute. That's just practical. And finally, we introduce an equivalency statement, a sort of a this equals that. So when people look at the bylaws and they see select board, they know that that means the same thing as board of select men elsewhere, most specifically um, the charter. This solves our chicken or egg problem. We've got to start someplace, and we don't want to be out of alignment in the meantime. Next slide, please. So here's why we're proposing to make this change. When the town was incorporated in 1715, women didn't have the right to vote. They didn't have the right to serve in public office. They didn't have the right to do a lot of things. Um, and the language of the time reflected that. It made sense at that time. That was the 1715 mind. But 100 years ago, women earned the right to vote in this country and the right to serve on boards such as this. And women have been serving on this board pretty much steadily since 1974 and pretty much steadily since that time, we have been referring to them as men. So this dissonance is presumably what has caused a third of Massachusetts towns already to change over to select board, with more towns apparently on the way. So we're not exactly on the cutting edge here. This gender neutral, all gender language is consistent with other language that we use every day. We talk about 
firefighters and police officers. If we didn't do that, the HR departments would get after us because the legal departments would get after them because it would be probably considered job discrimination. If we were big enough to be a city, we would have city councillors and we would think nothing of it. So this is not really treading new ground here. Next slide, please. So here's how we propose to make the change. We start with the bylaws tonight because it's the easiest, fastest, and cheapest way to do it. I say cheapest because this change costs nothing to the town or the taxpayers. You get to vote on something that does not cost anything. Okay? <laughs> So if we do that, then we have lots of time, if we want to, to make the change elsewhere uh, when it's easy and convenient. Um, the website documents even stationary, if, you know, we can let, wait till the existing stock runs out. And then when regular charter review rolls around a few years from now, everyone's used to the change and the documents are all changed and changing the charter is easy. As you know, charter review, regular charter review is very time consuming and very challenging and we don't want to add to that. So we're starting with the bylaws because it's easier. Now, to be clear, it's only the bylaws that are within the four corners of these articles. I'm only telling you about those other possible events, and they are possible events, uh, just to, so that you understand why we are starting with the bylaws. But you will be voting on the bylaws and the bylaws only. Starting with the bylaws tonight also means that we're making a change just in time for the 100-year anniversary of women's suffrage. So we get an, a chance to make a little bit of history of our own if we choose to do so. <laughs> Next slide. <clears throat> so I want to bring this up before I close because I think somebody's going to bring it up anyway and I might as well answer the question now. Um, why select board instead of some other term? Um, select board is the smallest change that we can make and still remove the gender bias. It's all we're doing is taking out the letters O-F and M-E-N. The meaning of it is intuitive, and we're not implying any change to the board itself, to its scope, its function, or its operations. Uh, the term is also the same one that the other towns are using. All the other towns that are changing their terminology are changing to select board. Whether it's one word or two, that's the only difference, but they're all making that same change. If this change in the bylaws happens to trigger a change later in the charter, that will require state approval, and we want the state to approve this. If we're doing the same thing that the other towns are doing, we'll get easy approval. Next slide, please. Some people say that they think the wording is fine just the way it is. Um, they don't feel that select men is exclusionary and they don't believe that other people should feel excluded either. Um, that's actually okay. That's to be expected because this is how inclusion and exclusion always work. Some people feel included, and a few other people don't. They feel excluded, and some of the people feel that very strongly. That's the definition of exclusion. So regardless of your gender, if you don't feel excluded by this language, that's fine. I'm going to ask you to vote yes anyway. I want you to consider that this change is maybe not being done for you. This change is being done for me. This change is being done for some of your neighbors, some of whom are sitting near you tonight in the auditorium. This change is being made for the kids in school who will one day occupy your seat here in this room. Some people say they're traditionalists and want to honor history, and actually, I'm a traditionalist. I love history. I believe that history isn't something to be dishonored or ignored. It's something to be studied and learned from. That's how we get better. So history isn't something um, dead, it's really a, a living thing. It's something that we, we can make more of every day. It's kind of part of a continuum. So as we're thinking of history, let's, okay, I'll close now. Let's also give a thought to legacy, that best part of ourselves that we want to pass along to others. I ask you to vote yes so that we can pass the right message and so that we can send, um, our, we can give our kids a little better than what we had. Thank you for the time and I'll pass it back to the moderator. Thank you, Amy. Discussion on my right. Darlene Hayes, One Third Road. I'm standing in favor of this article. Uh, one, I want to also commend um, the citizen that brought this forward. It's been extremely well vetted. There's been an endorsement page online for a while. It has close to 200 citizens supporting this. But um, there were two points I wanted to make, and I very rarely write notes, but. It's really cool we have Titan on the back of this. Um, I spoke with Ann Zaja, from, um, the executive director of the Senate Office of Education and Civic Engagement at the State House, 
and as of January 2019, all committees in the State House refer to their chair as chair, no longer chairman or chairwoman. In addition, when returning, re referring to town municipal leadership in general, it is select board unless speaking to a specific town that still uses selectmen. Um, I just read a press release this afternoon for an announcement and Southboro goes by select board. Um, <laughs> another quote I wanted to read, Maureen Dwinnell, uh, she was a tax collector in town, she was our treasurer, she's a past selectman and she's currently running for selectman in the town of Upton. Here's the quote from her as of this morning. I think it's a good idea and needed. I'm all for it. Last, last week while putting out a, one of my signs, a little girl asked me why it didn't say select women. And I told her it's because way back when women couldn't vote or run for office, that's how this whole thing started be, being called select men. I see it happening next year in Upton and I'm all for it. I brought up this book, which is my third point. Um, pages two, pages one through seven, list all the um, boards and committees in town. And is a lot. And these guys are all volunteers, everyone's appreciated. But out of those pages one through seven, 54 references are to chair, vice chair, co-chair, including the selectmen, not one is chairman or chairwoman. Um, there's a couple directors, co-directors, but it's, it was all very gender inclusive and doing the same thing that's being the state and proactive across the state. Thank you. Thank you, Darlene. I, I neglected to <clears throat> get the um, recommendation from the planning board. Muriel? No, you did. You did. You did. You did. You did, you did. okay. On my left, Muriel. Muriel Kramer, 39 North Street, um, speaking as a private citizen, uh, having served as a, a member of the Board of Selectmen, now hopefully to be select board. Um, I just want to uh, make sure that people consider that it's not, it, what we say and how we say it is very important. Um, and it in, in, in fact is bigger than men and women. And this is about being inclusive um, to people who identify anywhere on the gender continuum. Um, and I think it's important to take a step forward in that, in that regard. Last time we, we updated the <coughs> town charter, we made a specific inclusion in the preamble of that charter to make sure that we would be proactive in this regard and welcome people from all walks of life um, and take action if there were, uh, if we saw any, any places where we needed to make improvements and to make people feel more included. The, the wording didn't keep me from running, didn't keep anybody from running. It's not about me, it's not about, it's not about anybody who feels comfortable with it, as Amy pointed out. It's really f to make sure that everybody knows that they are welcomed, included, and leadership is not tied to gender. Thank you. On my right? I'm Cynthia Astheimer. I live at 118 Hayward Street and I stand to support this article. I'm 65 years old now and I have opinions on just about everything, but my opinion on this matter, it's, it's not as important right now. Um, I'm going to continue to come to town meeting, I'm going to continue to volunteer and to participate in any boards and commissions and things like that. I'll continue to do that. But I'd like to look ahead to our students. Our students are grappling with all kinds of matter. Gender matters, race, culture. They have so much to deal with. And what about our young voters? Don't we want them to participate in town meeting? We want them to vote. We want them to eventually volunteer, as all these fabulous people have. If we are able to change that one word, selectmen to select board, if we encourage any student or any young voter to participate in our town government, why would we not make that change? Thank you. Mr. Herr. Mr. Moderator, Brian Herr, Elizabeth Road, uh, speaking as one member of the current Board of Selectmen. Uh, I believe I'm one of the longer standing members of the board over the last couple of decades. I'm currently serving in my fourth and final term. Um, I fully support 
uh, this article. I think it's a matter of uh, positive messaging, not only for ourselves, but for our youth in the community. And um, I hope this passes and I appreciate everyone supporting it. Thank you. Thank you. On my right, Irfan Nasrullah is a member of the uh, member of the Board of Selectmen, or Select Board, if, uh, if this passes. Um, I stand on the other end of the spectrum. I'm the newbie on the board. And um, I also want to uh, voice my full, wholehearted support for this, uh, for this measure. In my mind, I think the, the term is antiquated. It is something from the, from the past. And I understand that the traditionalists want to keep tradition but there's a lot of traditions that are worth abandoning at this point. Um, in my opinion, if this change empowers one woman to stand up and uh, take action, I think it's worth it. It costs us nothing. And um, I think it's uh, a revision of the nomenclature from the past to the, to the present. Thank you. Thank you. On my left. Ann Matina, 40 Eastview Road. Um, I also support this article, and I am really pleased to see it. I would like to just share something with you. Last fall, as president of the Hopkinton Historical Society, I was invited to speak to the fifth graders at um, Hopkins School about Hopkinton history. And um, I was introduced as a professor at Stonehill College and president of the Historical Society. And I did my talk on the town's history and everything. And at the end, it was time for Q&A. And a little girl raised her hand. And she said, can you tell me how you got your job? And I said, um, professor? And she said, no, president. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, yeah, not a lot of people wanted it. Other than that, I was. <laughs> Um, and it really struck me at that moment that if you can't see it, you can't be it. It's really important. And inclusive language, as was pointed out by the citizen petition, is the norm. And this is a tradition. It's a New England tradition, and I understand it. But it's time to open up the language. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Harrow. At Harrow 8 Spring Lane, while I support this article, my reason for coming to the microphone is to apologize. I did not bring a timepiece tonight. So I couldn't say that we'd gone over the time. This is not meant as an affront to previous per party to whom I pointed that out. Thank you. <laughs> On my left. Brendan Tedstone, 45 Pleasant Street, also a member of the Board of Selectmen. Um, so I speak against this article. <clears throat> the reason I do is that in our history, we've had uh, quite a few women selectmen. I've spoken to most of them. Uh, actually, I've spoken to all of them that are still alive. And um, all but one was in favor of keeping it selectmen. Doesn't, the term selectmen doesn't necessarily derive a, a, a gender-based, um, you know, uh, derivation of the of the title, it's it's a selectman. It's a it's a it's an occupation. It's it's a combination of two terms called selected human, and it was derived from a long time ago. And it isn't about men and women. Our current chair is a woman. Um, there are over 300 towns in this state, and I would say the ultra majority are still called selectmen. I don't know how to put it in eloquent terms, so I'm going to cut it short. It bothers me in this country, society, whatever it is, how crazy politically correct everybody is. And <clears throat> might not be the right time in my political career to say something like this, but <laughs> I certainly feel that way, um, and Hi. not. It hasn't been three minutes. You have, uh, you have twenty seconds left, so we, <laughs> we do want to be chronologically correct. All right, I'll be sure to hold everyone to that. Um, I also know that the vast majority of people that are supporting this article that I've seen post websites, I mean post um, 
posts on their website are a member of a website called Real Housewives of Hopkinton, a very exclusionary website. Time. Thank you. Thank you. On my right. Uh, Mr. Moderator, if I may comment to one point. Um, as I said in the presentation and as is documented online on HopkintonSelectBoard.org, um, fully a third of towns have already changed with more apparently on the way according to their documentation. So to suggest that it's a huge majority that hasn't changed yet, I'm not sure that that would not be misleading. On my right. Leslie Ficari, 57 Greenwood Road. I just want to talk about tradition for a second, and there might be some of you in this audience that remember this. When my mother started as a teacher, she could not stay in the classroom when she started to show that she was pregnant. So when my brother was born and my sister was born, she needed to leave her job and lose her seniority. When I came along, Title VII had passed, and so she did not lose her job. She also had to wear a dress to school. She could not wear pants. And she couldn't have a credit card, even though she had a longer work history than my father, because he needed to co-sign for it. If you think all of those traditions have not gone by the wayside, then maybe you should vote for this article, or not vote for this article. But I do want to say I am a <clears throat> chief human resources officer. I have over 25 years of experience. What we are talking about today is the evolution already that has happened in the business world. We see it also across our state. It does make a difference from all of our diversity and inclusion research that we have done and our implicit biases that we have. It does make a difference. So I implore you tonight to please vote for this article. Thank you very much. Thank you. On my left, no clapping. Ms. Wright. Claire Wright, member of the Board of Selectmen. And uh, I'm probably going to have calumny rain down upon my head for speaking in opposition. Um, I agree with much of Mr. Ted Stone's words. He took most of them out of my mouth. Um, I really appreciate everything that's been said tonight. I respect it. I understand it. Um, but I am. I wear the badge of Selectman proudly. Um, I have never actually even thought twice about it. Um, as I have said previously, when Neil Armstrong put his foot on the moon and he said, one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind, he wasn't leaving anyone out of that statement. And I do feel we have a lot of issues to deal with in this town. Um, I feel in some ways this issue can have its own divisive side to it. Um, I believe in strong women. I don't think women today are easily frightened off. Um, I'm not afraid to speak my mind even though I may be in the minority. I think you can see that. And I'm a traditionalist for over 300 years. Hopkinton, one of the majority of Massachusetts towns, has had a board of selectmen. And I would like to keep it that way. I do believe in this hall, two thirds is usually more than a majority. Um, so I, I don't support this article. It's, it's not the hill I'm going to die on, and I respect everyone's feelings. But um, I, I would prefer to keep with our tradition of 300 years. Thank you. And you get a gold star for using the word calumny at town meeting. <laughs> on my right, John Catino, uh, one David Joseph, also a member of the Board of Selectmen. I'll stop by saying I still have an open mind on it. I um, <clears throat> grew up with three sisters, a mother and a grandmother, and God bless me with daughters. So I've been a uh, proud member of the National Organization of Women for almost 30 years now. Um, and I do believe that uh, gender neutral is, is a good way to go. However, the only thing that gets me nervous about this one is we're calling it a select board. Uh, you know, is there something even more neutral we could go with? Because being, again, it's, that, that sounds exclusive. These, this, these are the five selected people. 
is there something to even more gender neutral or more neutral and not just gender neutral that we go that's why i was thinking even town council or something else i'm not going here to make an amendment and to put put anything like that out but i just wanted to throw that out there you know because you know a, a select board or a member of a select board sounds even more exclusionary but um that's all thank you thank you on my left hi rebecca ahern walkwitz of 44 proctor please speak Grove in Street. speak into the mic i think i am can you hear me <laughs> there we go i'm making a motion to move to vote okay is there a second so there's been a motion made to could could we get your name and address again Rebecca Ahern Walkowitz. I have two addresses, 44 Proctor and 34 Grove. Which is your voter registration address? <laughs> you don't know, okay. We'll figure it out. <clears throat> uh, so we're, we're voting to end debate. All those in favor of ending debate signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right, that's a clear majority, and so we're now going to take a vote on the, um, that was just, yeah. We're now going to take a vote on the uh, main article as, as it's proposed, Article 43, <coughs> changing uh, Board of Selectmen to select board in the zoning bylaw. This requires a two-thirds uh, vote in favor. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed? No. All right, we're going to have to stand and count. Those in favor, raise your yellow card and stand. Twelve on the stage. Left front 25. Left front 25. Mr. Moderator, center front 33. Center front 33. Left back, 50. Left rear, 50. On the right, 75. 75 on the right, and there were eight in the cafeteria. Okay.
Mr. Moderator, center rear 55. Center rear 55. All those opposed, please rise and hold your yellow cards up. Two on the stage. Center rear six. Center rear six. Mr. Moderator, center front nine. Center front nine. Left front five. Left front five. On the right, 17. 17 on the right. Left back, 10. Left rear, 10. And there were four no's in the cafeteria. I got 53. OK. Uh, 258 in favor, 53 opposed, and so it meets the 2 thirds majority. Uh, Article 44, this is essentially, um, well, I think as a matter of form, we should have Amy move this. Uh, Mr. Moderator, I move Article 44 as written. Okay. Second. Is there a second? Second. Is there any further discussion? This is the same, essentially the same article, but it's application to the general bylaws as opposed to the zoning bylaws. Okay, seeing none, all those in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? No. And it's a clear majority, and so passes. Article 45, Ms. Wright, Board of Selectmen. So we move this article as written in the um, warrant and motions document. This is a new kennel bylaw. Josh, can you advance this? Does it have the tracking of the changes, which are mostly towards the end of it, highlighted in red? Well, while he's trying to do that, um, the purpose of this kennel bylaw is basically to provide more clarity and specificity in the standards and the procedures for issuing a kennel license. Much of this is actually our existing kennel law with some additions made to it. Even though we were actually told by some anim animal welfare professionals throughout the state that our kennel bylaw was one of the strongest in the state, uh, let's just say experience is the greatest teacher. We have learned of deficiencies and areas that needed um, more specifics. And so what we are doing here is a change in the bylaw that is going to set out clear, consistent guidelines for both the applicant and for the inspecting agencies. The key highlights of it are first off, that a kennel will require an inspection. There is some latitude, I believe, for smaller private kennels, but it does require inspection. It makes accommodations for who will inspect the kennel. It may be the animal control officer, or it could be the animal control officer's designee. That could be uh, 
the Hockington Police Department or others um, who are also designated to carry out the operations of the animal control officer. It clearly delineates what an inspection includes and what is required to pass. And probably most importantly, if there's been a problem, did you fix it? Um, it differs from what we've had in the past in that it includes a provision for record keeping. It requires the kennel operator keep proper records at the kennel, that those records be available for inspection and that they be kept in proper order. As I just mentioned, it ensures that prior problems have been corrected. If there's been a suspension or a revocation or the kennel has needed to cease operations for any reason, we must be sure that the problems that necessitated that closure have been corrected. It also includes other agencies in town who may need to make sure that the kennel is up to standards. These might include the Hockington Fire Department, the Police Department, Municipal Inspections, or the Board of Health. It also fixes what I've come to call the calendar loophole. The way our present kennel bylaws operated, it was strictly on a calendar year basis. So if a kennel was closed for any reason of, of a problem, when the calendar year or the, the licensing year ran out, it was simply a new day. That operator could apply for a new license as if there had been no past. And there needs to be an opportunity for the town to review the reasons for the closure and make sure that those have been corrected. So if a license expires, whatever has been wrong in the past must be addressed. The new law provides provisions for the denial, the suspension, and the revocation of a license, and this includes reinspections, fines for violations, it includes a provision for a citizen's petition if citizens feel there is a cause for suspension or revocation, and should a license be revoked for cause, that license cannot be reapplied for for three years. Some of the items you may have seen earlier are primarily housekeeping items to keep the terms consistent um, and, and the proper references. But in summary, this new bylaw makes clear for all parties the standards and expectations and the procedures in all areas. And um, mostly what's been highlighted in red is where the majority of the changes are. If you were to be doing a side by side, much of what you have is in the existing bylaw and the new additions which will provide um, clarity and really fairness for all parties are highlighted in red. Are there any questions of the Board of Selectmen on this article? <clears throat> Michael and Holmes, 5 Holt Street. I don't have a kennel, I don't have a dog, but I have a question in any event. Um, it's to do with 62-7D, the name and address of the owners of each dog kept in the kennel other than dogs belonging to the person maintaining the kennel. Is there any kind of um, limit on the number of dogs the kennel owner can have? Yes, there will be a limit. It will be posted in the kennel so that any time it's inspected, it can easily be seen if the kennel owner is over, is over that. And I think some of these requirements for addresses may refer to where the dogs have come from. Do, but um, so the question, if I may ask another adjoining question, is, um, what is the limit? That will be determined by the structure of the kennel. I mean, it depends on how many kennels are in the kennel. For instance, you might only have four kennels, so you would be limited to four dogs or a kennel that might have 20. But that means that if, it's, if, if there are, for instance, only 20 kennels, there's only space for 20 dogs, you can't have 30. 
with dogs doubled up in, in kitchens and bathrooms and outdoor kennels and various places. So it lets, sets a limit based on the facility. So if it's five, if there are five kennel spaces, that applies to the owner of the kennel if they have two dogs. They're taking up two of the five, is that right? Well, unless they're kept in, a, in their home. Okay. But it, it's so you don't have overcrowding. On my left. Mike Huber, 24 Chestnut. In, uh, I guess it's line seven or eight here under the heading of humane, uh, there's a word in there that I don't think belongs. It says, uh, um, shall include willfully permitting an animal to be subject to unnecessary torture. And I believe the semantics of that is wrong and the word unnecessary should be stricken from this document. Because it, it, I mean, unnecessary torture. <laughs> torture is torture. I think that word should should be stricken from the document. Are you proposing an amendment? I suffice to move. <laughs> I think that was probably just a full. I mean a. What do you call it? A, a little mistake that somebody made, and uh, and, it, and it's a carryover from the old bylaw. It, all these definitions are taken verbatim from the old bylaw. So you have a good point, Mr. Newman. If you want to make an amendment, is it ten lines? Uh, apparently, the town council informs me, informs me that it's part of the statute. Okay. The state statute. So there is necessary torture. <laughs> <laughs> You'll have to ask your uh, state uh, representative. Okay. Any other discussion? Okay, seeing none, we're ready for a vote. <clears throat> All those in favor of Article 45 as drafted, signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? And it's unanimous, and so voted. Article 46, 76 Main Street Historic District. Sponsor is the Historical Commission. I'd like to move the article as written. Go ahead. Can you see the, uh, the, we have the presentation. <coughs> okay. All right, so I'm Amy Ritterbush, 54 Grove Street, chair of the Hopkins Historic District Commission. And this is, and this is uh, Mike Ruan. Uh, you can stick your address. Uh, Six Hayden Row, and I'm chairman of the Historical Commission. So this article would be to vote on the creation of the Aaron and Lucy Claflin House Historic District at 76 Main Street, and it would require a two-thirds majority vote. And this um, article was put on the warrant by the Historical Commission, which is Mike, so I'm gonna have him do the first um, two slides, and then I'll give my piece. So if you can move the second slide. So how did we get here? Well, on December 5th, about five months ago, we received a demolition application for the front structure at 76 Main Street. Now that was one of 22 demolition applications we had received in the previous 18 months. But Kobe Wallace and the town do a very good job of screening all of the demolition applications that come to us because we only have purview over any structure more than 75 years old. So the first thing we did is we looked at the age of the structure. And we used this map in front of you to confirm that it's at least built at 1794, because that's the date of the map, and it's circa 1790 based on the Mass Historic Commission's database. So not only does it meet the 75-year criteria, it beats it by threefold. So that allowed us to quickly determine that this structure was historically significant. But in order for the Historical Commission to take any action, we have to do one more thing. We have to determine that it's preferably preserved. In order to do that, we need public input. 
So we convened on January 4th of this year a public hearing that was well attended by residents and neighbors. In that meeting, we quickly assessed that we needed to try to protect the structure. So we voted, the Historical Commission voted to institute a six month demo delay. But the members of the public said, can you do more? And we debated. We said, well, we can go to town meeting and we could put an article on the town meeting to extend the demo delay by 12, 18, 24 months. So we discussed it, and we voted to extend it to 18 months. That's the next article, it's the last I'm gonna say about that. Another member of the community said, can you do more? And we debated, and we said, well, it's very short timing, but it's possible that we could create a single structure historic district. <clears throat> and so we voted on that, and that's why we're here tonight. The Historical Commission enabled a study to confirm that this structure was historically significant. And we found out several things. One, this is one of the four oldest structures in downtown Hopkinton. And that also, it is historically significant, not only because it's hand-hewn timbers, it's horsehair plaster, it's granite, but it's more than that. And if I could, I'm not gonna read the whole letter, but this is a letter written by Harold S. Wood, December 4th, 1961. And I'm, I'm only gonna paraphrase a few things. I have sought for and think I have found the old inn in Center Hopkinton. I have a copy of an old militia order to the Hopkinton Company to assemble for drill, dated 1792. The assembly point was Aaron Claflin's Inn. On my maps, Aaron Claflin's house is the house now owned by Mr. and Mrs. A.W. Davis, 76 Main Street. So tonight, I'm going to ask you to vote in the affirmative to protect the Aaron and Lucy Claflin House and in part return the favor bestowed on us <clears throat> over two centuries ago. Thank you. So if I could have slide four. So after the Historical Commission submitted the art uh, article to town meeting, the Historic District Commission takes over as the study committee. Um, so what we did is that we submitted the preliminary study report on March 1st, 2019 to the Mass Historical Commission. We also, because we were a little bit new to the process, we had a site walk on March 9th, open to the public. We also had a preliminary public hearing on um, March 20th. And then we reviewed, on April 17th, the Mass Historical Commission reviewed the report and advised Hopkinton to establish the historic district for 76 Main Street. It's an advisory recommendation, not a requirement. And then on May 1st, we held our public hearing where we received, a, again, overwhelming support for, for keeping the, the home at 76 Main Street on site. We received a petition with over 104 signatures of residents, and the first two pages are actually a list of residents who would actually like to have their own houses in the district too, which we can't do this year because it's not in the warrant, but it would be something we could bring forward another year, the, the, the houses that are surrounding 76 Main. So our, slide five. Right, so what will happen if we vote no on this article? The owner has proposed to demolish all of the buildings on the site, which would happen after July 4th when the demo delay expires and to construct a new building. The new building proposed is a three-story, 43,000 square feet mixed-use development with 14,000 square feet of non-residential space on the first floor and 26 apartments on the upper floors. Uh, slide six. Okay, this is the photo of the existing site. Slide seven is the historic streetscape. Um, slide eight is some of the other homes in the existing streetscape. 
And a lot of these homes are the residents that, might, that would like to be included in the district in the future. Slide nine is renderings of the owner's proposal. Um, slide 10 was an attempt to um, sort of superimpose the proposal over the current streetscape. And then an aerial view with the new project superimposed is number 11. Okay. And then slide 12 um, is what would happen if the town votes yes to establish the Erin and Lucy Claflin House Historic District. Um, the Historic District Commission can permanently prevent demolition. The commission would review all changes to the exterior of 76 Main Street that are visible from a public way and no building permit for the construction of a building or alteration of an exterior architectural feature or no demolition permit shall be issued until a certificate is issued by the commission. I can give you more detail on the process if people have specific questions, but that's the general, generally how it works. Slide 13. So this is the public library, which is an example of a property in the district that was renovated and greatly expanded, but it still maintains the historic character of the buildings and the streetscapes. So it is possible in many cases to renovate and expand and modernize, but still keep the historic look at the front. And then, I think we're out of time. okay, I think we're out of time. So thanks. Okay. Are there questions? <clears throat> Mr. Moderator, on my right. I'll try to get this right. Uh, Brian Herr, member of the um, Hopkinson Select Board. Would th this is a question to town council, if I could, please. Would this be considered spot zoning? Well, happily, this is not zoning, so it, can, it is not, in fact, spot zoning. Um, the, and just so that you understand, if it, even if it were um, uh, uh, subject to uh, the prohibition against spot zoning, spot zoning doesn't mean that one property is zoned differently from all of its neighbors. What it means is that one property is zoned differently from all of its neighbors without a legitimate planning purpose. Mm -hmm. So in the, case, in the context of, of um, historic districts, the, the, uh, we can never adopt a uh, historic district without first uh, going through the study and getting the approval of the historical commission. There are, in fact, dozens of single property historic districts all over the Commonwealth. If I could ask one further question, Mr. Moore, please. Uh, to the applicant or to the, to the developer considering developing this site, has there, been any, given any, has there been any consideration to maintain that front house and then do development behind in a way that it, they kind of blend together somehow? Um, if, if, could I speak? Go ahead. So we've had uh, a good bit of dialogue with the developer and, <clears throat> and his agents um, regarding the potential outcome of this meeting and subsequent actions that he might take, including potentially move the house. He's offered to give us money to move the house, but I think our interest is the location of the house, where it is based on its history, its legacy, its tradition. Uh, regarding your question about spot zoning, the Mass Historic Commission, as Attorney Morales has, has indicated, has approved the single structure historic district, and it's one of hundreds in the state. In fact, in a litigious city like Cambridge, there's over three dozen individual historic districts. It's a way to protect a historic structure that otherwise would not be protected. And finally, we have neighbors, and they may come up, who will actually willingly volunteer to become part of the West Main Street Historic District, which is, I think, in all of our best interest. Thank you. On my left, um, Mr. Uh, Mastriani. Uh, yes, Paul Mastriani, 9 South Bond Road. <clears throat> I actually am the owner of uh, 76 Main Street. And to that question, uh, Mr. Herr, we extensively looked at trying to save, you know, the front of the building, all of the building. Um, you know, it, it does look nice. 
um, you know, I bought it, so I liked it for some reason. Um, but unfortunately, the inside of the building doesn't look like the outside of the building. And we did have, um, you know, we had a GC look at it, and it was, you know, it just wasn't financially feasible uh, to, uh, re you know, to go inside, bring it up to code. Uh, you, know, we, you know, we even talked to the, uh, the fire chief, went over with him, and unfortunately, um, in this case, you know, it, just, it just does not work uh, to be able to, uh, to do that. Um, that being said, I don't know if I even agree with um, if it is legal regarding, I mean, I think this is spot zoning. That's a, you know, it's a whole other question. So, any other questions for this? Do you want me to just keep on going regarding this, Mr. Moderator? Thank you. On my right. Shannon Riley for Clydesdale Lane. Um, first of all, I think we would all agree that regardless of what happens with this article, um, Hopkinton was fortunate to have forefathers and foremothers uh, as uh, esteemed as the Claflins uh, were. So I think that regardless of the position someone might take, it's not denigrating the Claflins regardless of their position. Um, but while legally this may not be spot zoning, I think it is poor planning. Um, and I think that the, the, the way to remedy that is for the town to come up with a way to identify structures that it would like to have preserved and proactively engage, figure out a way to preserve them and then, uh, and then go ahead and do so. Willy nilly, higgledy piggledy. Oh, we're going to save this one. We're not going to save that one. It's not, not really an effective way to plan anything, and it doesn't, it doesn't uh, uh, have an overall uh, effect on the town if it's all one onesies and twosies. Um, and this is a le another legal question, I guess. And this is my second point. Um, would this this change would be a governmental? Uh, change in a governmental regulation that would limit the ability of the owner currently to um, build the, the pr uh, project that he had planned to build. Um, as such, and I'm not a lawyer, but as such, I believe that it could be a governmental taking and that the town would owe uh, Mr. Mastriani some money. Um, because the value of the property would be diminished by the fact that he can't do what he wanted to originally do, and the price he paid for it was based on his original concept there. So I'm not speaking in favor of it. I'm just saying that these are issues that need to be considered. Thank you. On my left. Nanda Barker Hook, 75 Grove Street. I'm a member of the Historical Commission. I'm speaking as a resident. Um, in 1969, the town voted to establish a historical commission and gave the commission a mandate to protect and preserve historical assets in the town. And they did this because they had um, the foresight to understand that you need legal regulations to protect historic buildings. And this article before us, supported by the historical commission, um, is directly in line with that mandate that was given to our town, by our town, to us um, as a commission when it was initially established almost 50 years ago. Um, if you look to our master plan for an update, um, on page five under master plan goals, retain the rural and historic fabric of Hopkinton, facilitate and encourage historic preservation. <clears throat> there is a lot of support for downtown revitalization and expanding our commercial tax base. And I fully support those things. And I think they're excellent goals. The question is, do we need to destroy historic buildings um, in order to accomplish those goals? And I would say no. Um, I don't think that downtown revitalization and historic preservation are mutually exclusive and at odds with each other. I think it requires some creative thought, and I think the library is a perfect example of this. So if you vote yes on this article, I don't think that that is an anti-development vote. I don't think it's going to necessarily stop development. Um, I think it's going to give the Historic District Commission a seat at the table 
so that they can help come up with a compromise to revitalize this property while preserving its irreplaceable history. And so given the prominence of this location, the fact that it's almost one of the oldest buildings in our town, it's situated among many historically significant buildings, um, I don't think it's too much to ask for a seat at the table. Thank and you. And so I'm voting yes. On my right. Uh, Darlene Hayes, One Third Road. Um, I keep going back and forth on this, and since the developer's here, maybe he can answer this. Maybe you guys can answer it. Is there a way, if, can you go back to the slide that had the overview picture of what the project would look like? Uh, it would be a 10 or 11. Um, the one that was, you saw the, that. I mean, is there a way that maybe it could be made smaller and get both? I mean, I think we'd like going to 110 Grill and, and stuff. We'd like, we want more businesses downtown. Is there a way that there can be both? Maybe this can be made wicked smaller and only squish parts of that building that aren't historic? I don't know, I'm just if, asking. If I could. Well, let, let's let the developer comment. Mr. Mastriani? <coughs> Uh, again, Paul Mastriani, 9 South Bend Road. Again, I am, um, I'm, I'm, I'm not against preserving, um, you know, buildings in town. I'm, I'm definitely against, you know, uh, at the expense of uh, property rights. And that's exactly what's happened in this case. As far as that question, and I'll still, you know, I'll speak a little bit more, you know, about when I bought the building and everything else. But, um, you know, we are looking at this building and everybody's, you know, making a big deal about the size of it. Um, you know, it is, you know, it's, it's 43,000 square feet. It conforms to every local uh, zoning bylaw. We're not getting uh, any variances. We're not getting any special permits. We're meeting all setbacks. I mean, everything we're doing um, is by right. So as far as the question that uh, Mrs. Hayes asked, we are actually looking, again, and I don't really, I, I don't really think they have anything to do with this discussion, but um, I am looking at uh, thinking about scaling it back and getting rid of the, um, the two floors above and instead of being 43,000 square feet, uh, it's going to be 14 to 15,000 square feet just of, you know, commercial retail, which again, I think the downtown really does need. I think it would help revitalize um, and obviously again, for all the reasons with the taxes, with the amenities and everything else. but. I don't know if that answers your question, but we are looking at doing that, um, you know, scaling down the size of the project. Thank you. A, a point of clarification, if I uh, Point of clarification. Yeah, I, this, this article is not about the development of the site. This article is specific to the 1,800 square foot structure at the very front of the site. They're two different issues. Well, but, but let, me, let me interrupt at this point. I mean. The Historical Commission did intrude upon that by presenting pictures of what the development would look like. So to the extent that you've shown the development and you using that in part as an argument against, sure. you know, what's going on, then, uh, yeah, that's all right. On my right. <clears throat> Peter Helberg, my wife and I live at <clears throat> 78 Main Street for 22 years. We have enjoyed looking at the Claflin House that sits right next to us. Many of you have enjoyed that privilege much longer. It is a beautiful, classic New England home that has historic significance. As was mentioned, those of us who live along this section of Main Street and own antique homes feel very strongly about this and we are making a commitment to extend this historic district westward up Main Street so our houses will not be subject to possible demolition like this house. <clears throat> At um, one of the, the, the historic commission meeting last week, Mr. Mastriani's attorney stated that he was dealing from a position of fact and those of us who oppose this were dealing from a position of feeling. I would like to say to you that the fact is that there are some of us who really do want to save historic structures and we respect the history that they exhibit. But I will admit to you that there is feeling involved in this. For those of us who enjoy old homes, we realize there's nothing more than the feeling that you get when you walk into an antique home 
and you see the workmanship, the detail, the architecture of what was built 100 or 200 years ago by people with their hands and simple hand tools that cannot be duplicated today. A few weeks ago, when having a discussion with one of the members of the planning board, this member stated that this whole issue was heartbreaking. And I agree with you that this is heartbreaking. It would be incredibly heartbreaking to have this building demolished for the sake of progress. And it would be even sadder to have this building wiped away merely for the sake of profit. I ask all of you to consider this and to vote in favor of it and the next article in order to save a piece of Hopkinton's history. Thank you. On my left, Mr. Hyman. Mark Hyman, 12 Hidden Brick. Um, I have a couple of questions about this. I mean, it, first, um, in response to a, a comment that was made by the proponent, um, you indicated that this is really about the 1,800 square foot um, structure at the front of the property. But, and I'm not an expert with meets and bounds, but when I look at the district, it appears that the district is proposed to cover the entire building. Is that correct? It would cover the entire lot. Is that what you're so the entire lot. So you're proposing to historically protect more than the 1,800 square foot structure. Yes, but we, we would, we've informally discussed that we don't object to tearing down the 1970s building behind it, but until we have a different proposal in front of us, we can't really vote on whether we would allow the demolition of the 1970s home. But we've, we've discussed informally that it's our priority to keep just the main front house built in the 1700s. Okay, thanks. Um, my, my second question is, um, with respect to establishing the, the historic district, um, and the comments about spot zoning, I, you know, I agree it's not zoning either, but, and uh, there are single, single building or single property historic districts uh, around the Commonwealth, but when I looked at the guidance from the Mass Historical Commission, they do say that it's more desirable to protect the character of a larger area, and they say where, in areas where a larger area is feasible, there should be clear justification for the establishment of single building districts. And to me, it seems that from the presentation that was given at the beginning, there wasn't any real impetus to create a historic district here until Mr. Mastriani had put a plan in place um, after the, and after the fact, that's the motivation. Now, I, I'm a history buff. I really appreciate hearing the history, which I didn't know about, about this property, and I'm torn for that reason, like Ms. Hayes was. But, um, you know, this does seem to be a much more reactive proposal than a, than a proactive proposal, and that gives me concern. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Rohan. Yes. If I could, um, we value all of the historic structures in town. In the 80s, Gretchen Schuler did an inventory of historic structures. We actually, three years ago, submitted for a mass historic grant and received it for $25,000 to study historic structures. Unfortunately, based on the mass historic guidelines, we were only able to study 100 structures. And this is my mistake. We chose properties contiguous to the East Main Street side of the current historic district where I reside. That was my mistake. We had a discussion as to whether we were gonna study multiple areas in town, extending Woodville, West Main Street, were both in discussions, look at the meeting minutes. They were both discussed as potential sites for this mass historic study grant of 25,000. But we determined at this point in time, we would only study East Main Street. So we studied 100 structures on East Main Street. Our intent would be to go for additional grants. So I don't believe that this is negligence. I believe it's always been our intent to look at West Main Street, we just didn't get the, on the ball. Okay. On my right, Ms. Wright. Clay Wright, 28 Hayden Row, I support this article. Just because something is a right does not always mean that it's right. Those who appreciate and value our history, those with the humility to recognize our very small and fleeting place in the march of time, understand that owners of significant historic properties are entrusted with their care. Yes, they're owners in terms of documents and finance, but they're caretakers, guardians of our history. 
They hold our heritage and our community's soul in their hands. For roughly 300 years, the Aaron and Lucy Claflin House has stood on Main Street. Think of the stories its walls could tell. The humble farmhouse in the little country town, headquarters to Hopkinton's militia, an inn for travelers on the road to Boston in the early 1800s, at the center of Hopkinton's industrial boom, and today, still a landmark structure in the heart of Hopkinton. How can we not respect and value this? It's irreplaceable. Like those travelers on the dusty road to Boston, we too are just passing through. Our history goes before us, teaches all of us and those to come, enriches all of us, and is bigger than we are. The Claflin House and all the property behind it can certainly have a wonderful, new and vibrant, productive commercial use in our downtown. We need that and would encourage it. Throughout Hopkinton, examples are everywhere of blending the old with the new to meet modern needs while preserving the town's character. The school admin building at 97 Hayden Row, the new library, offices at 17 Main, renovation of the 1894 old high school, and the renovation and expansion of many downtown residences prove this. Collaboration, not conflict. Treating each other as partners for success, not adversaries, and respecting the character of our town are the key. Thank you, Claire. In, in closing, may I finish, Mr. Moderator? Has beautiful, beloved Hopkinton in its desirability become just a cash cow where every red cent has to be milked out of every square foot? I hope not. I'm leaving you with the words of Sarah Delano, a woman who single-handedly rescued the wailing city of New Bedford from almost demolition in the 1970s. And she said, when you bulldoze your heritage, you become just anywhere. On my left. No clapping, please. Jim Burke, 80 Pleasant <clears throat> Street. Uh, I spoke, uh, I speak for yes on this. Uh, A.W. Davis, uh, as she, they spoke of, was my grandfather. And they bought the house back after the World War I. And I was probably displayed there in my diapers uh, proudly when I was born in, 50, in the 50s. Uh, there was no mention of this being a historic nursery school and kindergarten for years that they ran from that <coughs> building. Uh, I, I don't know exactly how many years, but there was uh, people in here probably went there if they're as ill as I am. And it was, that, that was also a, a great use for it. There was a, a little farm in behind, and uh, they used to let the kids go down and, uh, and visit the animals, and it was a great homestead, it really was. And I can remember going there in, until she passed, and you know, into the 70s, and it, it was just, uh, it, it was a home. And to find out all this other old history, we didn't know all this, and to find out the other history, it just adds more to it, in my opinion. And to take this and to bulldoze this, it's like taking out your front tooth and walking around like that. And that's what Hartman is going to look like if they do it. So I, I hope all these people have read this and understand that once the bulldozer bulldozes it, it's not going to come back. Thank you. On my right. Christina Beck, 11 Valleywood Road. I ride in support of this. Um, I've lived many places at this point in my life. I've lived in the St. Louis area, and I went to a graduate program for history in Virginia. And I have to say, there's no place like New England. What makes New, New England unique is that it values historic preservation. No two buildings are really the same. And I have to say, uh, there's developments like this one all over the country, but there's only one Claflin house. On my left. Uh, Brian Douglas, 14 Greenwood Road. Uh, can I ask uh, two quick questions? <clears throat> uh, how does this property function today? Are there tenants in the property would how does it function today um, the developer wants to answer but it's an office uh, today uh, it is um, it used to be century 21 for about 25 years and today uh, it's Berkshire uh, Hathaway um, it's a real estate office they're gonna be leaving in a couple of months uh, and they actually were the ones that sold me the property 
um, you know, they, they decided to sell the property because, again, it just it didn't, again, everyone's saying things about this house. Uh, this isn't a home. It's not a resident. This is literally a commercial building, which has been commercial for 30 or 40 years. Um, I, I hear the sentiment, um, but I, again, I, I just think we're losing track of I, if the house to the left, the Hilbergs, absolutely beautiful. Um, I respect what they did. Um, in this case, this is not the Hilberg residence. This is a commercial building. And you had a second question? Uh, actually, that answered my, my <clears throat> second question. So uh, I appreciate that this property is old, um, but what brought you to the conclusion now, after the property has been on the site for a couple hundred years, it's got a real estate agency inside of it. I think I saw a made pro business in the back. I'm just trying to understand what made it historically significant now. So it's been documented as historically significant since the 80s, I, I guess. And in, in our study in 2016, it recommended we create the Main Street Historic District, including this home and several others, the old high school around it. But it's hard to get everything done at once. And until this was um, on, the, on the table, we had to act quickly. So I definitely appreciate that the house is old. I, I read the document that was with the, hand, the handout that came with the property. I, I appreciate history. I love old homes. I feel like the house is old, but not necessarily historic. I mean, it's not like Paul Revere lived there or Bill Belichick lived there or something, right? Um, uh, so so I, I say that with all due respect. I, I mean, I value the comments of the previous speakers. Uh, I certainly uh, am torn on the issue as well. It's, it's difficult to approach. But the timing of this doesn't feel right. It feels a bit disingenuous. It feels like a reactionary uh, response to uh, the fact that we don't like what the builder is proposing there. Um, and so, uh, I, so I don't love that. Um, so I, I respectfully rise against this article because I feel like there are other ways to accomplish the means that I think you're looking for here without having a reactionary one house historic district six months ago, as opposed to if it really was as historically significant with the long legacy and just meant so much to the area, this probably should have been done 20, 30, 40, 50, 100 oh, years ago. Okay, thank you. On my right. Michael and Holmes, 5 Holt Street. I was a former um, chair of the uh, Historical Commission. And this was always a significant home. It's not newly significant. <laughs> and it was always marching up the hill toward my first residence, which was at 84 Main Street. <clears throat> there's Phipps, there's, 80, there's Summer Street. That was Kit McNabb's old house, gorgeous. Nobody's going to tear that down. There's my old house. Somebody might. There's another not, it, <laughs> they're mirror images. The guy built them in the 1840s for his two daughters. There was an adjoining um, carriage shed that was gone. So you look at those house, houses across from Steggy Prep and remind yourself of what they were. I lived in one of them. That doesn't make any difference. <laughs> But the tree warden, who used to wear a pith helmet, <laughs> do you remember him? In any event, he lived next door. Um, the districts should march up that hill because those houses will go the way of this one if we do not. There's Steggy Prep, there's four houses. They, okay, they're um, so beautiful, they're not gonna get torn down. Let's this limit it to this article, please. <laughs> I vehemently oppose it. Thank you. On my left. Thank you, Mr. Lamar. I have Patrick O'Brien, 13 Ray Street. Uh, just to start um, beginning is, I'm not a big fan of change. If someone out here has a magic wand that can shoot Hopkins and back to 1983 when I got here with a population of 7,500, one steady uh, traffic light in the center of town, Kalala's. Brown and Smith's and the Golden Spoon. I'd take that in a heartbeat. But I do realize that change is inevitable. I, like probably most people in this room, is uh, like and very fond of 76 Main Street. I had the pleasure of working in that building for two years when I was with Century 21. And it is certainly a, a fine structure. And I applaud the Historical Commission for all the work that you people do try to keep the 
fabric and the history of Hopkinton alive. However, I do feel uneasy with the way this article has been presented. Besides loving old buildings, I also believe in being fair and honest with people. When the current owner bought the building, he bought it under the current uh, zoning and rules and regulations of the town. After he presented his plans, the Historical Commission came up with this 76 Main Street Historic District bylaw that would effectively stop the current owner's uh, proposed plans. I feel that if we allow town boards and committees to come up with general bylaws after the fact, we'll be heading down a slippery slope. I was hoping that the owner and the town could come up with some mutual agreement, but sadly it doesn't appear that's gonna happen. Thank you. Can I make one clarification? Go ahead. Uh, the demolition application was submitted on December 5th. I do not believe any plans were presented to any public body until a few months later. So the demolition application preceded any plan. So our actions had no basis on what the developer may or may not build. It was solely to protect what we felt was a valued resource. On my right. Thanks. My name is Eric Klein. I'm at 36 Glen Road. Um, this is my first uh, comment at a Hopkinton town meeting. It's actually my first town meeting of any kind. Uh, and I, I'm glad to be here. I, I appreciate all this. M my view of this is, I mean, it is hard not to have your heartstrings tugged when you hear that the Hopkinton militia mustered at this house and it's still standing. That is something we should all still care about. At the same time, I also feel that we are stewards of this town as much as the Claflins were in their time, and the town must grow, it must change, there must be development, and so I'm torn. And I get the sense that probably a lot of people here are. I'm sure most of us probably feel both of those things in some measure. So my problem here is the process. So I'll, I'll join my voice to those who've commented before in saying that they were uneasy with how this has been presented. This slideshow seems to imply the argument that this home should be preserved because this superimposed commercial development would be so much uglier there. And I think it, it would be. But that's not the right way to go about this. As stewards of the town, this town has to take a broader view, balancing the need for historic preservation with commercial development, not on a one by one or ad hoc process like this clearly is, but in a more developed and thoughtful way. If there's going to be a West Main Historical Association or district, we should think that out and balance it against what kind of commercial Main Street we want to have, not fighting over this one property. So my suggestion here would be that this article be defeated, but my understanding is that the next article is one that freezes the issue in place for another year. That's what we should do. We should put a pause on this and develop our ideas about how we're gonna balance preservation and commercial growth thoughtfully on a citywide basis, not on a, a home by home basis. So I'm against this, but I am in favor of pausing this issue and doing it more thoughtfully. Thank you. Thank you. On my left. Ann Matina, 40 Eastview Road. Um, I just, as president of the Historical Society, would like to speak to a couple of things. First of all, that the board, as you can imagine, of the Historical Society unanimously supports this particular effort. Um, we don't believe that it's reactionary. Um, I've heard a lot while I've been standing here, a lot of different um, understandings of how this came about and that it was reactionary and that we sh if we were going to do it we should have done it years ago and uh, you know I don't think people really get the fact that the Historic District Commission and the Historic Commission is people they're volunteers 
who give a lot of time, energy, effort to try to preserve Hopkinton's character and history, um, property by property, if that's the way it has to be. I don't recall, and Mr. Mastriani can correct me on this, I don't recall that I ever saw this house come up for sale. A minute ago he said Century 21 offered him, or the, the current owners offered him the building so to buy it. So I don't remember it coming up for sale. So there really wasn't an opportunity for any mechanism or process to start until that demolition order came through to the Historic Commission. Historic Commission or District? Well, it, it came to the Historical Commission as commission. a demo application, and we transferred the uh, sponsorship of the article for a local historic district to the Historic District Commission. Right. So Thank we're both you. involved. That, so I guess in conclusion, I'd just say two things that, again, they've already been said, but we tear it down, we're never going to get it back. And there isn't any replacement for this building in terms of this is part of the streetscape. It is part of Hopkinton. We do have the Historic Commission and Historic District Commission who are appointed by okay. the board Thank you. to protect. Thank you. Yeah. Can I just answer that question about the house being on the market? Yes, go ahead. Um, the house was on the market for almost three years. So it was on the market uh, for a long, long time. On my right. Uh, John Palmer, 87 Main Street. Um, I'm the owner of the um, Greek Revival just to the west of the old high school. And uh, I would be pleased to have my home included in a West Main Street historic district. Um, and I think there are a number of other owners, um, and some of them in this room, and which, who ought to come up and say the same thing. Um, uh, that's one point. The, the other thing that's bothering me um, about um, the d dialogue about how we got here, we got here on this article, it's very easy in my mind, there's a bulldozer coming on July 6th, and if this article does not pass, that house is gone. And the only way to stop that from happening was this single district, single building historic district, and that's why it's here. It is reactionary, but it's reactionary for a specific purpose, to save the building. Now, the third, I do want to make a third comment. I'm, I'm a historic preservationist, I'm an active member of the Historic Society. I'm familiar with the Harold Wood letter that was uh, read in part. And I'd like to add to that. That Harold Wood letter uh, was seeking uh, an answer to this question. And this question arose in a, um, a history of Hopkinton that was written by uh, Reverend Elias Nason, and this is what, he, what Reverend Nason said. In 1743, the town appropriated 30 pounds for a stock of ammunition. This was probably in anticipation of war between England and France, which was declared June 2nd, 1744 in Boston. Mr. John Taylor was the inholder at this period and at his tavern, the Mellons, the Denches, the Jones, the Gooches, the Wilsons, the Walkers, Woods, Bixby's, and Claflin's met to discuss the stirring questions of the day. Harold Wood believes that this inn that's referred to in Reverend Nason's article was in, is in fact the Aaron Claflin Inn. And if that's not a reason to sub to preserve it, there is no reason. Thank you, John. Tatsa Starry, 19 Elizabeth Road. Um, I'm going to join the people who are really torn on this article, which I think is a good chunk of the town. Um, it is a shame when there's a historic building like this that's at risk, 
Uh, I've lived in a couple of historic homes before moving to Hopkinton, uh, both over 150 years old. I think the historic structures have so much more character inside and out. They're better built, that's why they're still around. Um, but, then there's, but then there's just the question of how this has transpired. And I know that we've heard various stories and we've heard that this place was on the market for three years and nobody else bought it uh, until the developer did. And now all of a sudden this is coming around. And I understand that this was a, a property that was marked prior, but there was nothing done to really protect the property. Um, so I do look at this as a, as a property rights issue. I'm hopeful that uh, something can come about in the last minute to save the structure at the very least, if not in the same place, and possibly moving it. I know, I've, I know I've heard that the owner is amenable to helping with that. Um, but in the end, I think that this is a property owner's uh, right. And I guess I have to ask myself, you know, given the history of the building and the Claflin family, what would Mr. Claflin do if the government came and tried to change the rules on him and tell him how he could use his property? Might use some of that ammunition he was storing. <laughs> Um, we've, we've been discussing this article for almost 30 minutes. I, I think a few more comments, and then I think uh, I'd like to have someone call the question. So on my right. Nancy Stevenson, 18 Hayden Row. I'm on the Historic Commission, but I'm speaking as a private citizen. God, there are so many aspects of this that I wish everybody could fully understand. <clears throat> I know it does seem like this is reaction reactionary, and I guess in a way it is. But when I think about the Historic District um, Commission trying to see how people were interested, how interested people might be in expanding the Historic District downtown, and one person said, well, why should I have my home in an Historic District? Anybody that buys an Historic home is not going to want to tear it down. But that's obviously not true. People buy properties, they don't care what's on it, and they want to mow that down and put what they want on it. This is not about what he wants to put in its place as far as whether people live there or whether people work there in restaurants. I mean, I, I would love to encourage the revitalization of our downtown. And I think there's a real opportunity to do that. But you can have both, have both things. And as far as um, discussion with the owner about um, maybe moving the house, there was discussion about that. But that was taken off the table when we did not meet the deadline. So please consider this, because this is very important to many, many people in this town. If it's not important to you, it's important to a lot of other people. And it really does, um, it, 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 it's part of what has made this town the place that we love. Thank you. Thank you. On my left. I was hoping you wouldn't get to me because people are going well, to hate you me. Well, you could call the question. Yes. Um, okay, let's call the question. Does that mean? <laughs> Is there a second? A motion has been made to end debate. Can I, I mean, can I say something regarding as far as the building? Am I done? <clears throat> Look. Okay. Please, please. No shouting out. He I is the developer. I'm going to give him an opportunity for a final comment. Can I make a brief yes. comment, moderator? Point no. Point of order. The question has been called. <clears throat> but I haven't taken a vote on it yet. Yeah, I'm going to toll that for a minute. Mr. Mastriani, please. All right, um, again, I've been a resident for 23 years here. Can you have a little respect, please? Please, okay, don't talk you. to the audience. Talk to the moderator, um, please. All right, Mr. Moderator, I am willing to work with the Historical Commission. I've offered, uh, you know, substantial monies to help move it, disassemble it, um, store it. Um, obviously, we have it, you know, we had it for sale for one dollar. I'll even give it away today. Um, but. And I'm even willing to give the Historical Commission, you know, another six months, if that would help, to figure out what way we could put it and do something like that. I am trying to work, and I am cognizant of 
you know, what everybody's saying. I get that, but unfortunately, again, this, this building languished on the market for years. The Historical Commission, uh, they decided to do nothing, and they did, did not designate it, take any action to make it, you know, historic, and again, and, I, and I'm, my property rights are being violated. All right, thank you. All right, we're now going to vote on ending debate. All those in favor of ending debate signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay, so the <clears throat> debate has ended. We're now ready for a vote on the motion. Article 46, creation of a, let me get to it, 76 Main Street Historic District. This requires a two-thirds vote in favor, and so we'll take a standing count. All those in favor of the article as proposed, rise and, and uh, hold your yellow cards up. Six on the stage. Front 38. Left front 38. Mr. Moderator, center front 34. Center front 34. Mike, I've already counted you. I got you. Left back, 60. Left rear, 60. Center rear, 68. Center rear, 68. <laughs> on the right, 81. 81 on the right. Okay, all those opposed, please rise and hold your cards. Left front four. Left front four, stage was nine. Center rear, 12. Center rear, 12. 
Mr. Moderator, center front seven. Center front seven. Left rear 18. Left rear 18. On the right 20. On the right 20. The vote is 287 in favor, 70 opposed, and so it meets the two-thirds majority. Hey, please. Did you forget so soon? <laughs> article 47, Mr. Rohan. Um, article 47, we move the motion as amended. Could um, we put the amendment up? So um, this amendment, um, I'll ask, should I have the proponent speak to the amendment? proper um, well move the motion and then we'll entertain the amendment and then okay so um, yes. yes go ahead and move the original motion all right I'd like to move the original motion um, article 47 extension of demo delay and a quick overview of what article 47 is intended to accomplish At article 47 is simple it's doing one thing it changes our current demo delay of six months to a term of 18 months. I have a presentation that I will present as to why that's necessary. Okay. Uh, why don't we hold off on the presentation until the amendment is made? Mr. Hyman. Yes, Mark Hyman, 12 Hidden Brick. I have, a, I believe, a friendly amendment. Um, so um, it's as depicted on the screen, um, the amendment, er, the overall article proposes to um, apply the 18-month um, demo delay retroactively to any delay periods that are currently pending. The amendment I'm offering here um, is to allow an appeal, if one wasn't done beforehand, within the normal appeal period after the amendment takes effect. So in other words, an, a demo delay can, can be appealed within 30 days of the order normally. This, you know, the, any that had this had applied to didn't get appealed. This will give them another shot at an appeal, and I can speak more to the rationale otherwise. Okay. Is there a second to the amendment? I, I second that. Okay. Is there a discussion on the amendment? Does everyone understand the, the amendment? <laughs> on my uh, right. Point of order, uh, Mr. Moderator. What is your point of order? If the maker of the motion accepts it as a friendly amendment, is there any need to vote on the amendment? Uh, yes, I believe there is. All right, seeing no further discussion, let's vote on the amendment. Uh, the amendment would extend an additional right to someone aggrieved by the dem the, um, this action to give the developer another right of appeal. All those in favor of the amendment signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, and so it passes. So now back to the um, motion as amended. Mr. Rohan, you have a presentation? I, I do, um, and I'll try to be brief. Uh, you guys have spent a lot of time here, and I'm, I'm very appreciative of your attentiveness and your attention. Um, next, next slide. There are a lot of historic structures, and yes, the Historic Commission has not inventoried them all successfully. Uh, that's our bad. But we do want the opportunity not to have to go through the process we just went through. We would like to extend the demo delay to 18 months. There have been structures demolished, and I don't even want to, I'm going to go th uh, skip through this. So if you don't mind, Josh, go to, uh, uh, the endangered structured slides. So 76 Main Street and 149 Hayden Row Street are currently under six month demo delays, both of which are set to expire on the 4th of July. So those two properties would in fact be affected by this action you're taking. And to be fair, we agreed, uh, we're, the amendment to allow them to appeal this decision is only appropriate. So thank you for accepting that amendment. Um, we're not trying to take property rights away from anyone. We're trying to protect historic properties. 
um, go to the what is demo delay. So we have worked hard to collaborate with the building inspection department, um, Mr. Kalick and Mr. Shepard, to have a clear understanding between both the commission and the building inspectors, what is demo, when are you demoing a property? And Attorney Morales has written one of the best bylaws in the state according to the mass listserv for this. So demolition is the removal of major pieces of structure. If you want to blow out a sidewall to put a sun porch, go, go for it. If you're tearing down the roof of a salt box because you want to add two and a half stories, that's demolition. So we have a very clear definition in the bylaw for demo. What we're asking you to consider now is how long can we deliberate over that demolition? Our goal and objective is to work with property owners. 18 Cedar Street, 9B Street, one, uh, 57 Hayden Row Street are all examples in, in 119 Hayden Row, all examples of people who owned properties that have worked with the Historical Commission to benefit both parties by preserving what is there or in some cases replacing it in kind, identically, uh, per architect's drawings. So we're not trying to be resistant to development. We're trying to maintain the character of the, of, uh, the town. Next slide. So why 18 months? Well, currently we have six months. Some, some parties submit the demo application before they even develop plans for a project. And then it expires before their permitting process is even complete. We want to try to avoid that. We want to try to give the appropriate amount of time. This is a chart that shows currently Hawkington at the very top. We're one of only a few towns that has a six month demo delay. Hawk Holliston actually has a shorter one. We're proposing to extend it to 18 months and that's in green. So we will not be in the majority if you agree to 18 months. But I need to tell you why we believe 18 months is appropriate. If you go to the next slide, um, this is an email from the Mass Historic Commission, Chris Skelly, who leads the process for historic preservation. He had encouraged us to extend it to 24 months, but we didn't think that was necessary. Next slide. We do think it's necessary to go to 18 months for this very reason. Nine Church Street. Nine Church Street had to get relocated to expand the library. We all knew that. We had a developer who was willing to buy it and move it but he only had six months. He could not get the new location permitted in time to move the property. That was a lesson learned. We believe that we need 12 to 18 months to get a permit for a new location and move a house, which is our last resort, but again, still preserving a historical legacy of the town if you accept this article. So, to be brief, I'm advocating that you accept the article to extend the demo delay from six months to 18 months. Is there any discussion? Mark Hyman, 12 Hidden Brick. Um, just to clarify if there's any question, now that the historic district has been proposed for, or has been accepted for um, 76 Main, my understanding is that this delay and its applicability to 76 train, Main is pretty moot. Yes, but there is one other property that <clears throat> affected today, and this is about tomorrow. This is about yesterday and tomorrow. Right. I just, I just want that to be clear to when we vote. This isn't about 76 Main anymore. We've resolved that issue. Thank you. On my right. Nancy Stevenson, 18 Hayden Row Street. Um, just two, uh, two points um, that I wanted to make. One, um, like Mike said, that we have had situations where people have um, applied for, for a demolition on a property and the, the, the six months ran out or in some one or two cases, we gave them permission to, to demolish the property um, and they demolished it and then they never did anything with it. We've got properties that are for sale, empty lots, because they did it because they changed their mind or they couldn't afford it or a variety of different reasons that just happened. This will allow them to get all their 
ducks in an order before that last resort happens. And if it doesn't happen, then we're not, we don't lose a, proper, a house, a building, and they don't either. If they're going to ultimately sell the property because they don't, don't want to do with it what they were going to, they at least have a house on it. So that's, um, that's a really important thing. Another thing is that when we talk about this demo delay and it, it comes, um, a property comes before the historic commission and we say, okay, we're putting, this, uh, putting a demo delay on this, it does not mean that that house is going to be stuck in limbo for six months or 18 months. It's going to be on hold until there's a resolution. And sometimes the resolution happens within a month. Most times it happens, if it's gonna happen, it happens real closer to six months because we really do need more, more time. But it's not, we're not gonna, if we see that nothing is gonna be able to come from it, we have let properties go. So that, that's all. Thank you. Mr. Weissmantle? Ken Weissmantle, 145 Ash Street. I'm a little concerned on this particular article, and I'd like to start off with, by giving some people some of the history of the demo delay on the now vacant lot behind Clawless, right where Snappy Jogs basically sets up. Clawless had a big expansion plan for that area, and they got a demo delay on this one house that was later determined to be full of termites and I forget all sorts of hazardous material. Eventually the thing got done, taken down. But in the meantime, the big plan for Clullas with specialty shops and everything else was on hold. And in that period of time, the price of steel went up 20%. And Dale was never able to build it. Now I don't know whether it was the unattended consequences, but maybe that was, if Clothes had retransferred himself into something else, would it still be there today? I think 18 months is an incredibly long time that I worry about. Business cycles change. Uh, you know, it's, 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 it's a pretty big burden that you're asking for 18 months. Thank you. On my right. Uh, Shannon Riley for Clydesdale Lane. Um, I would uh, just make the point that 18 months in the real estate world is a second. And things change quickly as um, was just stated. Conditions change, people's financial uh, um, situations change, and 18 months is, a, is everything can change. And so asking somebody to wait for 18 months is, is a big deal. Um, on the other hand, um, 18 months in the town government world, maybe that's, uh, no offense intended, but maybe that's not unsurprising. So I think that if this, I understand the need to have a longer demo delay, and I think that that's um, perhaps appropriate, but I think there also has to be a commitment to a process that will move this forward in a timely fashion on both the part of the developer and on the part of the town. So I think that with, if there is an extension, and I don't have a, you know, um, amendment or anything, but I think there really does have to be a concerted effort to move the process along. I understand that there are uh, committees are made up of, of volunteers, and believe it or not, I used to be on the historical commission. Um, but it's important to people whose money is in, in limbo um, to move things forward. Thank you. On my left. Brian Brock, 19 Wood Street. I'd like to propose an amendment for a 12-month demo delay instead of 18 months. Second. If possible. Um, certainly it's possible. Do you have the... Have you provided anything to the amendment desk? Are you, are you suggesting that everywhere 18 I'm shows? I'm suggesting should be 12? that 18 months gives government an excuse to no, prolong. I mean, uh, the, the specifics of your amendment. Everywhere where 18 shows, 12 should show instead? Yes. All right. Is there a second? Second. second. All right. So, uh, um, 
<clears throat> an amendment to the uh, bylaw has been proposed to, lim to extend the demo demolition delay from six months to 12 months as opposed to six months to 18 months. Is there discussion on the amendment? Can, can I make one remark um, relevant you, you to- You can en enter the discussion, sure. I, I just want to make one remark because it's clear that this concern about the proprietariness of the historical commission arbitrarily withholding the developer or builder or owner's right to property development. We have, as I mentioned earlier, over the last 18 months, have had 22 demolition applications for structures 75 years or older. We have entertained four demo delays of those 22. So we are trying to be very prudent and judicious about the implication. We understand 18 months is a long time, but if the end result is moving the structure to allow the property owner to do whatever they want, if that's the end game, we can't accomplish that in 12 months, in my opinion. Ms. Wright? Clear right, 28 Hayden Row, and speaking as a former member of the Historical Commission, um, despite its name, the demolition delay, it's not really intended to stop someone as much as we actually referred to it as a historic preservation bylaw, because the intent is not that it's going to obstruct people, but to allow a window of opportunity to work with a proponent to find a middle ground. And the problem with the six month and even a 12 month and why I continue to support the 18 is that a long enough period of time causes a proponent to feel like, oh, I will come to the table, I will work because it's too long to want to wait it out. I'm, I would rather collaborate and find a solution. And it's not because we want to hold you up and make you suffer for as long as you possibly can, but to allow that window of opportunity to negotiate. And we all know we're always more likely to come to the table if we can shorten the time frame and move on with our project. And that's why 18 months does this in a way that six months cannot, and I don't believe 12 months accomplishes in the same, with the same uh, effectiveness. On my left. Uh, Peter Edwards, 21 Cunningham Street. Um, I really respect the spirit of the Historical Commission and what they uh, are here to do. Um, as a third generation uh, member of the community, I certainly love a lot of pieces of this town. Um, my concern is that uh, if we should be looking at these things far in advance, um, as is right now. So if your house is built before 1944, you guys have the right to restrict that for what you now ask for 18 months. As a real estate broker, um, that's going to change the perception of those properties for prospective buyers, knowing that you have the ability to stop them from putting that addition on or changing the roof line. Um, I would suggest that you guys proposed doing some sort of deed restriction for the properties that people want to try to preserve and allow them to say, yes, I don't want this to be torn down in six months, I'll put a deed restriction that it could have uh, an 18 month review by the Historical Commission. Um, I think that gives you guys a little less power, which is, um, I think, a good thing. Um, but I would, I would encourage you guys to, if there are these properties, you know, make those deals with the current owners. Uh, Peter, Peter, we're talking to the amendment to consider whether it should be 12 months as opposed to 18 months. I don't believe it should be longer than six months. Okay. On my right. Nancy Stevenson, 18 Hayden Row Street. I just wanted to <clears throat> make a comment about something that Ken Wisemantle pointed out as far as the house behind Kalala's. I, okay, uh, we're, th this I this has to do with the-, the, the I want to restrict it to 12 months at this instant. 12 months or 18 months. Are you in favor of the amendment to bring it to 12 months? or are you in favor of retaining it at 18 months? That's all I can say, then 18 months. Okay, thank you. All right, if there's no further discussion on the amendment, an amendment has been proposed that would change this um, article to 
allow an extension of the demolition delay to 12 months as opposed to 18 months. All those in favor of the amendment signify by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed say nay. Nay. I think we need to stand. If you're in favor of the amendment to 12 months, stand and raise your yellow slip. Twelve on the stage. On the right, 29. 29 on the right. Mr. Moderator, center front, 17. Center front, 17. Left front, 21. Left front, 21. Center rear, 23. Center rear, 23. Left rear 43. Left rear 43. Okay, all those opposed, rise and hold your yellow slips. Four on the stage. Left front, hold that one for a second. <laughs> Left front, 15. Left front, 15. Left rear, 21. Left rear, 21. On the right, 56. 56 on the right. Center front, 20. Center front, 20. Center back, 50. Center rear, 5, 0. Okay. Uh, in favor, 145. Opposed, 166. So the uh, amendment to move to 12 months was not accepted. So now we're back to a discussion on the main motion as originally presented and amended. Is there any further discussion? 
Okay, I see we're ready for a vote. All those in favor of Article 47 as amended, signify by saying aye. 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 Uh, please, if you have a question, come to the mic. It, it is amended. It, it's amended to allow any developer affected by this extension of delay to appeal. That amendment stands. Okay. Again, all those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed say nay. Nay. Okay, that's a clear majority, and so as amended, it passes. Oh. It passes. It did not require two thirds. Thank you. Article 48. Street acceptances, Ms. Kramer. Article 48, street acceptances. I move the article as written in the town warrant. Ms. Wright, Board of Selectmen. The select board recommends approval. Capital Improvements Committee. Capital Improvements recommends approval. And Planning Board, Ms. Ms. Kramer, I assume you? Planning Board voted to approve. Okay. I think this is self-explanatory. Is there, are there any questions? Dave Ball, Planning Board. This is another one of my public service uh, announcements from the Planning Board. Just to inform the, the town a little bit, these two developments are a um, brand new streets by um, a type of development called LID that you guys might not be aware of. It's called uh, Low Impact Design. And what it is is you'll see that they're very different than our other developments. In fact, there's no um, catch basins or no underground uh, drainage. Um, it, it obviously is less expensive for a developer to do it that way. Um, I think it um, works in many ways. Um, now I'd just like to speak as a private citizen because I did have one comment as an opinion on that. Um, these two are kind of out and about and you may not come by them, but if you drive down Legacy Farms North and Legacy Farms South, that also is lid development. And uh, in my opinion, that doesn't work. If you drive down the, either one of those, you'll see um, lots of sand and whatnot off to the side. And uh, without the, the curbing, I, I think it just doesn't work on Mayor Main Thoroughfare. So I do, I do support this article. I just want to use this opportunity to let the town know about the two different types of developments. Thank you. All right, if there are no other <clears throat> questions or comments, we're ready for a vote. All those in favor of Article 48 as proposed. Signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? And it's unanimous and so voted. Article 49, Fruit Street Lease. Ms. Wright. We move the as written in the warrant and motion, articles and motion stock. That was cutting in and out a little bit. Okay, we, we move the article as written in the warrant articles and motions document. Okay, Capital Improvements Committee. Capital Improvements recommends approval. Okay. And is there a presentation, Claire? Very, very briefly. This is very straightforward. As you probably recall, um, there was an um, allowance made at a previous meeting to enable a lease on the Fruit Street property for a nonprofit philanthropic organization for the benefit of Hopkinton youth based in the town of Hopkinton. It allowed a 25 year lease and it has been made clear that for the amount of investment that would be required for an organization, they really need a lease that is for a longer period of time than 25 years. This is really not practical for any organization to make that kind of an investment. So the um, 
article would extend that period up to 99 years. Is there any discussion on this article? Go ahead. Randy Kramer, 39 North Street. Please move to the mic. Sorry. So it's just a, a question. Um, I understand that the original, uh, I believe the purchase of the land that this is with respect to, uh, did not include any provisions or caveats, uh, whatever the legal term is, regarding a lease. I understood that the uh, transfer of land uh, when the town purchased it held a condition that it be, uh, that land be held for the use of the youth group in town uh, with no without respect to a lease and I'm just asking if that's a correct statement or not Ms. Wright are you in position to answer that or is that a question for uh Attorney Miares, or yeah. Mr. Kamalo. I think the answer is yes. So this is take, uh, changing the original terms. I don't know if that's a, I asked the town council if that's even legal <laughs> to change the terms of the original sale of the property to impose a lease when there was no such agreement ahead of time. If, if I may throw the town moderator. Go ahead. The specific condition that we are referencing is contained in the purchase and sale agreement for the Pratt Farm parcel. The parcel under discussion is different. This is Fruit Street. Okay, so I, does, I, does I, that clarify? I, th I thought that was all considered universally as Fruit Street, so I stand corrected. Okay, thank you. Yeah. On my right. Uh, Mr. Kamalo answered okay. the question. On my left. Yeah, Mike Hume, 24 Chestnut. I, I have a little trouble here uh, <coughs> trying to understand a philanthropic organization. What organization is it? Have I been out of the loop that long? <laughs> what organization is this philanthropic organization? Simple question. It is to be bid. So there is no specific philanthropic organization uh, this instant until the bidding process happens. Oh, okay. Thanks. Simple question. Any further discussion? Okay, we're ready for a vote. All those in favor of Article 49 as uh, presented, signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? Aye. And it's a clear majority. Article 50, Chamberlain Street Curve. Ms. Wright. We move the article as in the warrant articles and motions document. And Capital Improvements Committee. Uh, Capital Improvements recommends approval. Thank you. Ms. Wright. This is a simple land swap. <clears throat> this will enable the work on the southwest side of the right-of-way for the Chamberlain Street development. Um, we will be swapping from a conservation easement a parcel of land approximately 1,400 square feet for 5.7 acres of land. So we're coming out ahead by a lot. Any questions? Mary Arnott, 51 Teresa Road. Um, I have, I think, two questions. Um, is the Conservation Committee involved in this? And if so, what was their opinion on it? And the second question is, are we setting precedents um, to remove land from a conservation restricted area? Ms. Wright? I don't know. I. I can't answer the question about Conservation Commission. We are, we are gaining land, so there's actually more land going to be held under the easement. Um, and perhaps someone can answer the question about uh, precedence for, for land swaps. I'm not familiar with it. 
Attorney Miyaris. <clears throat> so when there is property that is uh, in cons uh, subject to a conservation restriction, it is known in the legal biz as Article 97 land. What that means is that it's very difficult to remove land from uh, the conservation restriction. It requires a vote of the legislature um, by two-thirds. So this is, a, this is set up as a request for a special act that would authorize this. So it's a, it, 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 this is done from time to time. It's an um, arduous process. Um, and um, it only, each incident of this happening would have to go to the legislature for a two-thirds vote. If I may, Mr. Moderator, maybe I don't understand then, because Claire said um, we're gaining more land. Are we gaining conservation land? Or are we swapping conservation land for just general use land? OK. So uh, part of this process, the arduous process that I just described, um, the Executive Office of Environmental Affairs has a uh, policy that uh, is supposed to uh, govern their advice to the governor as to whether to sign this bill once it's passed by the legislature. And um, a part of their guidance is that there needs to be an equal or greater amount put into the uh, conservation restriction uh, under a conservation restriction um, as compared to what's being taken out. So that's the reason why this is a net gain. The land that we're gaining would be put under the conservation restriction. Okay, so we're gaining land that will expand it, but we're giving up the 1,400 square feet. That's correct. Okay, thank you. Henry Siegel, 112 Hayden Row. Uh, through the moderator, what is the intended use for this additional land? And what kind of um, restrictions are there on the conservation? Ms. Wright, what's the, what's the purpose for the swap? The purpose for the swap is the right of way on Chamberlain Street that's going to be part of the development of the new houses going in on Chamberlain Street. I believe there's a curve that needs to be straightened, perhaps. Um, so it, it, it's for the development. I understand that, excuse me, through the moderator. Yep. What's, what is going to be the status of the land received by the town? It will be restricted for, con it will be a conservation restricted parcel of 5.7 acres. For what uses? For the type of uses that any conservation restriction land would be, it can't be built on, it can probably be used for hiking or trails, but, but it is essentially protected from is that the intended, is that your expected intended yeah, through use? Through the moderator, please. Through the moderator, is that your intended, expected use for that land? Mr. Meares, can you speak to what conservation means, conservation restriction means? Yes, the, the language for the conservation restriction has already been drafted and ready to be executed. It's, um, it, uh, the, this essentially is going to be added to the existing um, conservation land. Uh, be, uh, uh, only available for um, passive uh, recreational uses, and uh, otherwise, its its uh, development is prohibited. Thank you. On my right, uh, Barry Rosenblum, Ten Briarcliff. I'm on the board of Hopkinton Area Land Trust. That's going to receive the land, and it's just going to be additive, like uh, Attorney Mayor has said, to the existing uh, holdings in that area and it's going to be used restricted uh, development and used for passive recreation. Thank you. Thank you. On my left. Amanda Fauché, uh, 39 Chamberlain Street. Is this part uh, to help soften the curve for the new development as opposed to making a really sharp mm -hmm. curve? Ms. Wright. Yes, my understanding is this is a request from the fire chief for safety reasons. Okay, um, just a point of notation. I'm also part of a chamberlain Whalen coalition, and, um, but speaking as a resident, also I understand it that it will help out the Ted Stone family. Um, they won't have 20 feet of their front lawn taken away, 
if um, this is a yes vote. Just a point of information. Thank you. Through you, Mr. Moderator. Go ahead. Um, I am not one of the Ted Stones of that. Uh, that I don't want anybody to think that there's a conflict of interest or anything here. I have nothing to do with this. Thank you. <clears throat> we were all concerned. <laughs> Seeing that there's no further <clears throat> discussion, we're ready for a vote on Article 50. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? And it's unanimous and so voted. Article 51, Municipal Parking. Ms. Wright. We move the article as written in the Warrant Articles and Motions document. Mr. Manning. Appropriations Committee uh, recommends approval. And Capital Improvements. Capital Improvements recommends approval. Okay. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So, Ms. Wright. Um, can you confirm that there's a recommendation from the Board of Selectmen and then go ahead with your presentation? Yes, the Board of Selectmen recommends approval. Um, this is an article to provide two types of much needed parking in the downtown area, parking for Town Hall and municipal parking. I think it's no secret to any of us that there's a parking crunch in the downtown. Um, for a long time, Town Hall has essentially encroached on a parking lot that is not ours. Many people may not know that Town Hall spaces are only the six parking spaces on the westernmost part. Um, as you do know, the driveway entrance is, com is controlled by the Bill's Pizza operation and the exit entrance jointly by the Middlesex Bank and the Masons. So um, we also are well aware with the increasing business in the downtown and the library and the vitality that we all want in our downtown, there's increasing pressure on parking. Uh, I personally have commented from time to time that there actually is still available parking up around Center School and down through the lights going up Main Street. But in the same way that water seeks its own level, people look to park where they want to, where they need to go. They, they aren't looking down the street or, you know, ar around the block. So uh, what we are looking for, there are two, co uh, three components of Article 52. The first is a component for a piece of land, excuse me? It's Article 51, not 52. I'm, excuse me, it is 51. <laughs> I'm thinking about 52. Uh, the first is a component to create a parking lot dedicated for town hall use. This right now is a parcel that is located at 6 Walcott Street. It will provide safe, dedicated park, uh, entrance and exit on to, off of Walcott Street for town hall use only. The second would be to provide a municipal parking lot and this will go out to a competitive bid process because there could be different parcels that, that come in that would meet the need. Currently we are considering two parcels, a parcel between a portion of 25 and 35 Main Street which would be a lot constructed by the developer for town use, or also a portion of land between 10 Walcott and 14 Main Street. This is behind Town Hall that could also provide spaces for the town. So there's the components of the Town Hall and the municipal, and a third component is raising the funds to pay for this, or to at least make funds available for the town to negotiate for these properties. Um, a little more on the Town Hall Walcott Street property. This is a 16,240 square foot property. It abuts Town Hall. 
it has the potential to provide us with 32 spaces and as I said, a safe driveway under the control of the town as opposed to six spaces and an entrance and exit controlled by others. Right now, we are looking at funds available through a debt exclusion for $520,000 maximum to negotiate for this property. The two possible municipal parcels which will be put out for bid through the RFP process, a competitive bid process, the 2535 main has a potential to provide another 32 spaces. It is 22,000 square feet. We are looking at up to 540,000 to negotiate for its acquisition. And the third parcel, potentially 14 main and 10 Walcott portions thereof, constitutes 34,000 square feet, has the potential for up to 120 spaces. Um, again, through an RFP competitive bid process, up to $1,550,000 to be negotiated. Um, it is likely the town doesn't need this much parking or would want to spend that much money. The total comes out to about 2.6 million and 184 spaces, which is probably overkill. But right now, we can't afford to wait till next year's town meeting. Some of these options may, may no longer be there. So we are asking town meeting to authorize this spending for the town to negotiate and decide on how the bids come in and how the negotiations proceed decide what will be in the best interest to meet the needs of the town. They are also um, articles that are going to be on the ballot. The town hall article is question three on the ballot and the two municipal parking parcels will be question four. Um, so we feel that these will allow our town businesses to prosper and provide parking for both business and our public facilities in the downtown area. Uh, Muriel Kramer, 39 North Street. Do, do we have a picture of I'm the sorry. three? There should be. Josh, do you have the picture of the two parcels? It's supposed to be up there. That one that you're looking at is, okay, num numbers you're looking at. Six wall cut us up on top, very is top one. This is, okay, Ten that's is to the right. All right. Okay. So, so this is just showing the parcels behind yeah. Town Hall. Six, the one at the top is six wall cut, and the one with the red 10 is a piece of the land that is behind Bill's Pizza behind the current the current parking lot that we use, yeah. though we shouldn't be using it. <laughs> um, do you have the 2535 Main Street? Okay. This is the proposed lot that would be behind the two uh, the two um, mansion house buildings. There has been a residential development uh, proposed in Bath, but that's not shown there but it would be behind those buildings which would provide access to some of the downtown businesses um, beyond using town hall parking and possibly another 32 spaces out of that piece of land. And that, as we understand it, the developer would construct it. So the cost should include development costs as well. Follow up, Muriel. Yeah, I just want um, to say that, that I'm not prepared to support this tonight because it seems very premature, um, very expansive, and very expensive. Um, that, that proposal, for example, 25 to 35 Main Street, um, hasn't begun to make its way through the process. It's very hard to, I don't know how you know what might be needed there or what might be possible there in terms of municipal parking. Um, I do want to say that I'm very supportive 
um, of uh, you know assertively looking at creative municipal parking choices. Um, I just I really want the Board of Selectmen and any invested parties to look at less land consumptive ways. For example, has anybody considered working with Bill's Pizza and maybe making a small multi-level spot behind there so we don't pave over the entirety of the center of downtown? If Mr. Moderate, I can just respond. You are, you are correct in that it is very early. There is no plan. It has come to everyone's attention and the business community has been crying for more more parking because it's it's really hindering the growth and the vitality of downtown. So what we're looking for is the ability to negotiate and the fle flexibility to work with some of the existing parcels that may be available not to pave over all of downtown. That's why when you if, if you take this in a whole, it's a lot, but I don't think that's what we're looking for. We're looking for the town to have options to negotiate and find a good solution. On my right. Uh, Darlene Hayes, One Third Road. I'm standing in opposition to this. Uh, it has not been vetted publicly. Uh, two nights ago, I s we sat here and watched the school committee do a parking proposal that was vetted, had how many, showed how many spaces we were getting, how much money it was gonna cost, uh, how long it would take to build. This is basically giving the selectmen a blank check up to su such amount of time. Um, our chair of the selectmen has just said it's early, it's, it hasn't been vetted. And currently, in ju last June, the selectmen got the keys to center school. That if a big part of the parking is staff at town hall who are parking at St. John's Church. Right now they own that building. That building is empty. They, they can park there during the day and come have a chance to actually vet this properly, get public input, Tell us real numbers, real amount of parking spaces, and um, go from there. Claire? If I may just clarify that part of the RFP process can be to accept other offers or offers of smaller pieces of land. So it's, again, it's flexibility, but it's not saying that this is what we're going to do. It's keeping all our options open um, to the maximum with the expectation that that is the maximum and it's beyond what we would actually need, but we don't know where those opportunities will arise until we can start to negotiate for them. On my left. Mary Larson Marlow, 238 Hayden Rose Street. I have a question, clarification question, and uh, whether or not the parking spaces that you mentioned um, are all on flat lots or whether there was any assumption of a parking structure being built. And in general, I support parking in the downtown. We desperately need it in order to revitalize our downtown. Um, and it works um, in conjunction with the downtown corridor project because we may be losing a few spaces on the street for that. But primarily, I'm looking for an answer regarding the parking structures and whether that's being considered. Thank you so much for that question. Uh, internally, yes, we've looked at options that may include a parking garage. Um, I can share with you that when we were looking at the Bill's pizza owned parcels, one of our concerns was that a parking structure, which is located on the currently um, unbuilt portion of that parcel, may be an intrusion on the neighborhood, especially uh, Claflin Street. Does that help? It wasn't me. <laughs> <laughs> on my right. Hi, good evening. Miguel Linera, 37 Pleasant Street. I've been in Hopkinton 18 years. This is the first time I get up here in town meeting to talk. I'm a little nervous. Um, so, you know, I like the idea of the parking, I get it. Uh, we're about to vote an Article 52, which is part of the Downtown Corridor Project, and we are promoting more biking, yet we're also promoting more parking. There's kind of an irony there. 
Um, and so also this article in, by itself, the, the numbers, it's just, it's just crazy. It's about 14,000 a parking space that we're talking about. So there's that negative, it's, it's premature, we've heard that too. The town needs it, we get that. I think that the best way to make this work, and this is just my thought, is to link Article 51 with 52 in order to make Article 52 a better proposal. Article 51, allowing the town the opportunity for the parking, and thus making the easement taking less necessary. We take the parking space, so we're gaining uh, 184 parking spaces. We take one side of Main Street, we lose those parking spaces, we make that the bike lane, we don't have to have the easements. Uh, I would like to make a proposal to join those votes no, together. Not, it's not something that we're going to consider tonight, sorry. Well, <clears throat> I would not vote in favor of the parking. If I may, Mr. Moderator, I would like to clarify again. Maybe I was wrong to add up the parking spaces. I figured you would add up the parking spaces either way. <laughs> The town is not looking for 184 parking spaces. We are looking for more parking, but we're not looking to overkill it. But we don't know which parcels we will be able to work with. That's why we're trying to keep the options open and asking you to give support to keep the options open so we can determine where we can get some parking. And I want to reiterate again, town hall right now is on somebody else's land when it comes to parking, and we must solve that problem. On my left. Ann Matina, 40 Eastview Road. Um, Claire, just to speak to your very last point, we brought the, this, this whole parking lot was brought up, it's been brought up several times in town meeting. Um, 2015, there was a big discussion about purchasing the parking, the possibility of purchasing the parking lot. And at that time, yeah, there was because of the... I'm sorry, which parking were you talking uh, about? Bills. 14 Main, 0 Main, which is part of Bills. I think it's kind of disingenuous at this point to, to not talk a little bit about that particular lot. First of all, the town has maintained that lot for years. We have plowed it. Well, well we have. We have. There are so, there are four corners to this article, and what we've done to plow, maintain has uh, really no relevance to the discussion. Mrs. So, Mrs. Wright said that this was an, a problem that needed to be solved. That we needed to not be on Bill's property anymore. Well, if that's the she, case, it, because... She made that comment and she also said that we need parking downtown, so... Okay. So the, my next question is, <clears throat> when, when Bill's was going to expand, before they built the new building, they bought 10 Walcott, they had plans, there were various plans that they put forth. They were going to go right out to Claflin Street, as Mr. Kamalo said, you know, that's, we don't want a parking garage there onto Claflin Street. But if I understand the history of this correctly, they were not able to build that building the way they wanted to because of the drainage issues in that strip of woods back there. So in the end, they gave up their idea of pushing the building back on the lot and they just tore down the old one and built on the new spot. Now it would seem to me that, so, so they've got all this property. They own all this property. They own 28 Main, they own four Walcott, they own 10 Walcott, they own all this property. Zero Main, which is, again is part of, four, it's, it's the Mason's old lot that they bought anticipating that they'd be able to go back. So are we gonna go through with this whole exercise and then find out, well, we really can't do anything. I and mean, there's a reason why that lot hasn't been developed in 315 years. <laughs> and I can't speak to the details of the development, but you know, there perhaps 
are different requirements for an entire building than there would be for a parking area. I'm sure the drainage would have to be dealt with. I think there are a variety of issues behind why the project years ago didn't go forward. Um, I don't think it's germane to this, to this um, discussion right now, but it is land mm -hmm. that may be available to us at this point in time. And um, the land that the town hall has been parking on, even though we have been doing plowing of it, its owner has repeatedly expressed consternation that the town most of the time is using their parking and it is a fair point. We need to have our own parking with our own access. Last so. question is, again, I know you have said to us that uh, this is just, we're just trying to put this out there so we don't miss an opportunity, but um, the amount of money that those properties at 6 and 10 Walcott are assessed at is significantly less than 1.56 million. And so for that reason and a lot of other reasons, I oppose this. I think 6 Walcott would be a great, um, uh, you know, a great compromise here because it would allow you access, it would allow you in and out to the town hall, but it's still not ideal. Thank you. On my right. Michael and Holmes, 5 Holt Street. Um, I really applaud the efforts here and the need for parking. What I object to is the total cost and lack of uh, consideration of how that might be improved upon. It may not be improved, well, two things. It would be improved upon immediately with multi-level parking. It would be approved upon immediately with metered parking. This is a, in a sense, <laughs> it looks like Newton, and they all have uh, metered parking. We can do that, or we could do multi-level parking. This is $2.5 million. I think it's a significant outlay for the town, and I think we can do a better job and a cheaper job. Um, I applaud it's to the folks who thought it up, but it's too expensive. Let me try to address the concerns regarding the cost. I think it is important that we make a distinction between the needs for town hall parking and the needs for general municipal parking. I do share your concerns regarding the amounts referenced. Let me speak to the town hall parking. We have been discussing and negotiating with the marketants for a while. I do agree that the assessed value for that property is less than what we are discussing tonight. However, it needs to be said that the assessed value does not account for what we miss at Town Hall we do not have a driveway under the town's control. Those who are familiar with that issue have told me about an instance several years ago where the previous owner of Bill's Parcel shut down that driveway. We do not control that driveway entirely. Secondly, we as a government institution <coughs> regulate parking Currently, our own building, town hall, does not comply with our parking regulations. 
putting aside the need for parking by the people who use town hall as well as employees who work there, put that aside. We enforce parking regulations. I would like to be the first one to comply with those regulations. In terms of the municipal parking, here is the idea. We have heard loud and clear over the years about the need for parking in the downtown area. And specifically, most recently, this issue has come up during the discussions of the Main Street Corridor project. The ask tonight is for town meeting to consider authorizing an RFP. And I think what I gather from this discussion are some of the issues that can be included in the criteria spelled out in that RFP. The reason why we have amounts specified is twofold. The two entities who have come forth in the downtown area and offered their land for municipal parking have named numbers. Secondly, when we drafted this article initially and the ballot question, we sent the drafts to our bond council. And bond council said, if this was to move forward, it is in the town's best interest that we name these numbers to town meeting. On my right. Dr. Connell was not, that's fine. Uh, Joe Regan, 37 Front Street, as an owner and as a seven year resident of the Walcott Street, we still own number 13. Um, that is a one way street. Are we going to change that? Because you're not going to have anybody coming up legally, and it wouldn't, shouldn't have anybody coming up to enter the six Walcott street, uh, street parking lot. And if we do proceed, sorry, no, one more. If we do proceed with that, are we going to eliminate parking on Walcott Street? It's a zoo right now. I know we added some when we added the stores to make our count legal to put the, um, the central house, whatever it's called, their restaurant. Yeah, uh, what are you going to do about getting people in and out? You're going to have to change that from a one-way to a two-way. And how far up will you go? I don't think you want to dump them out onto Maine in between the two buildings. Mr. Kamala? Through the moderator. At this point, this issue has not been discussed. And I think also it needs to be said that should the town <coughs> proceed with acquiring 10 Walcott Street, or oh sorry, six Walcott Street for municipal parking, we will have to go through a two-step process. The first is an informal sit down with the neighborhood and understand its concerns and the likely impact of the change on that property. Secondly, we will still have to comply with the town's regulations which require us to go through the town review process. Thank you. On my left. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Connor Deegan, 51 Pleasant Street. I actually rise in support of this article because of the fact that uh, right now, we're, I mean, for, for years now we've been talking about how we do need some more parking downtown, especially with the Main Street Corridor project looming over our heads at the moment. And there are businesses that are downtown that we want to see succeed that are struggling because of the fact that they can't get increased traffic to actually come and stay there. And now there is a point that there is street parking in a lot of cases, but really there's also a lot of people who are willing to go right past if it's not in front of their spot. There's also the fact that Town Hall itself, like Mr. Kamala pointed out, does not have the, uh, doesn't have enough parking to support its own staff or any of its visitors. And it results in us having to park on well, other residents and the people who come to, uh, to do town hall business are forced to either park relatively far away. For some people who have handicaps or are seniors, it can be quite difficult. And I, I end up hearing a lot of that uh, in town hall. And then, of course, it's quite a strain on employees of the town to have to park as far away as they do. I would like to see this, 
pop up in the back here with, with Walcott Street because it would be a good chance for us to be a better neighbor with the surrounding uh, business entities as well as to provide parking for our residents and our employees that work for us every day. And also having additional town hall parking serves to act as an auxiliary free lot to for municipal parking for the rest of the downtown businesses on weekends when town halls closed anyway. Thank you. Thank you. On my right. Jim Monahan, 305 West Main Street. Uh, I, I cannot uh, support this as written, uh, even though I do absolutely see the need for uh, if, uh, the first item, the purchase, or, or to pursue parking for the uh, town hall that makes total sense. It's the municipal parking. You know, it's a lot of money, and I understand it's, it's, it's just an a initial guess, uh, best guess. But given that, as was already suggested, we have uh, center school, which we're continually talking about how we're going to utilize that. There's more than sufficient parking. I'm sure just about everybody in here has gone to many towns, to restaurants or shows or shopping, had to go to municipal parking, and it, and, and it was not right in front of uh, the establishment where they were at. Didn't give it a second thought. Uh, and that would cost us what? Nothing? That's a pretty good price. Uh, it, again, it's, it's, it's just, you know, you're talking about a significant amount of money. Uh, and I think the other thing, in the, if, if there's, and I, there may have been studies if, um, that show that we're losing business because there's no parking. Uh, I, if there are studies that show that, that would be very helpful, as opposed to presuming that if somebody can't park right in front of a restaurant, they're not going to go. Typically, people make a plan. Uh, the businesses along that, uh, those locations are usually uh, are destinations as opposed to you know, it's not like you're going to Dunkin' Donuts and you say, hey, I'll get a cup of coffee. I'm going to drive in there and get the coffee. Those are usually destination businesses. So again, if there's information or any studies that show that that's necessary to be right there as opposed to a quarter mile away, then I, I could be supportive of it. But right now, it just to uh, support that large of expenditure without some really solid data, it would be a little bit uh, hesitant. Thank you. On my left. Matt Brodo, Three Revolutionary Way. Am I correct in my understanding that it, the, this, these properties are currently occupied by a forest that you want to use for a parking lot. The property at 6 Wall Street has a house on it. The property between 10 uh, Walcott and 14 Main is wooded. I, I wouldn't call it a forest. It's a wooded strip. And the property behind 25 and 35 Main right now has a garage and an expanse of lawn. It would be behind the mansion houses on uh, Main Street and going up behind St. John's Church. OK, have you done an environmental study on the wooded area? And for the one that has a garage, how do you plan to acquire that land? Are you going to use eminent domain? I mean, how, how, how are you going to get rid of that garage to put a parking lot there? We are planning on negotiating with the owner. Um, that's why we're here tonight requesting the, the town's permission. And the owner of that land right now is standing behind you, and he might want to address that directly. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Chuck Joseph, 5 Benson Road. And the uh, diagram that's up on the screen right now is the one that uh, we are proposing. If I can take a minute. I think there's a tremendous amount of confusion here on what's going on. I'm a little bit dismayed that these, are, that these three parcels are put into the same article. Mm -hmm. I wish that did not happen. Uh, we've been working with Town Hall for quite some time. And if I can uh, direct your attention to there, the two mansion houses in the front are not going to be touched. We have already worked with the Historic District Commission. and We are going to be putting some parking between the buildings and on either side of them. That is for the use of the current occupants of that building. Directly behind the building, you'll see a paved parking lot with about 32 or 33 spaces. That is the 22,500 square feet that we're proposing to sell to the town. And the green space behind it would house six duplexes or 12 condominiums. What we have done with the town, the $540,000, let me backtrack one, one second. The reason we're here now is that we are about to go in front of the planning board to present these plans where they will be fully vetted. 
in order to do that, we had to know if we're going to be doing a municipal parking lot on this piece or not. So we had the parking lot and all the uh, associated structures fully engineered and cost out by the excavation company, which we presented to the town. It is as open book as you can get. We are donating this land to the town. The $540,000 is for the construction of the parking lot. So that $540,000, the town receives a completed parking lot. The current owners of the front two buildings will own the front parcel. The municipal, the town of Hopkinton will own the parking lot and the condominium association will own the land behind. We felt we worked very hard to make this as transparent and fair a proposal to the town for municipal parking lot downtown. There are currently three driveways, one between the two buildings and one on either side. We have proposed an entrance on the bottom side and an exit on the top and the middle driveway would become a lighted sidewalk down to Main Street. We felt the location of the parking lot would behoove all the new businesses that are downtown. It would also provide complete sidewalk access to the new library we just built and no one would have to cross Main Street. So for those reasons, I, I don't know if we can do this, Mr. Moderator, but can amend to separate uh, item number two from the rest of them. Uh, I believe we can separate item number one from items two and three because that's the way that the ballot question uh, has been constructed. So, am I correct in that regard? Well, but how many votes are there? Okay, uh, I'm, so I'll correct myself. We can separate all three of these individually if, if, if town meeting would prefer. My only, my only point for this is I believe the other two are land acquisitions, and this, in this case, the land is being donated to the town, and the money is for the construction of the parking lot. Shouldn't matter. It's, it's, isn't it accommodated within the, uh, the, the vote of the ballot? If we separated these and had a separate vote, and you know, one or another yeah. passed, is there anything in conflict at the ballot? Okay. Mr. Moderator, there, if, we, if we separated these uh, individually, their town council indicates there would be no conflict with the vote that would be taken at the ballot. So each of these can be voted on separately. Each of these, um, each of these at town meeting can be voted on separately. At the ballot, you're voting on one and two and three, whichever of two and three might survive, and whichever I, of one might survive. I will bend to the so, will of town meeting, but I would like to propose that we separate the three as an amendment. Okay, so you're... Yeah. So a motion has been made that would separate consideration of Article 51, Item 1, item two and item three as, as individual elements to be considered. Is there, so there's a second, is there discussion on the motion to separate? Okay, if there's no discussion, then we'll take a vote on the motion to consider 51-1. I'll call it 51-1, 51-2, and 51-3 separately. So it's simply a, a, a vote on separation. All those in favor of... Point, point of order. What is your point of order? Um, if I want to suggest an amendment as well, would you like to hear it now or would you like me to wait? No, line? I'd like you to wait. All those in favor of separating consideration of these elements um, signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay, so we will consider each of these Thank individually. You, so let's continue discussion on part one, which is the expenditure of 520000 for the purchase of 6 Walcott Street. Is there further discussion on that first element? Not on Walcott Street. Please, if, if there is, please come to the mic. Mr. Moderator, sorry, go ahead. On, on my left. Rob Foisey, 25 Chamberlain Street. I'd like to uh, call the attention of town meeting to the Town of Hoppington Master Plan 2017 on page C, 
six, one of the key economic development goals of our master plan is to provide more downtown parking. That's been agreed upon by multiple people multiple times, and it's the time is now to put part downtown parking into effect. We can't do that without the money to acquire property to build parking. We've talked on on numerous occasions that we have this Main Street corridor project coming. Right? It is scheduled to be shovel ready after Marathon in 2020. Okay, we have less than a year before we start tearing up the downtown mm -hmm. streets for this downtown corridor improvement. And I don't know how many people besides me have noticed that in downtown in rush hour, traffic down there is miserable and we have vacant storefronts down there and businesses are screaming Ron, at let me, us. But l let me interrupt. This, what we're discussing right now is whether to proceed with respect to item one, which relates specifically to 6 Walcott Street. So are you in favor? Understanding that there are three different options that we're going to be considering. I'm sorry. Are you specifically in favor of the first uh, item that's being proposed? Yes. And not, not to the exclusion of the other right. two, but so we're going to... I'm, I'm in, fr in favor of downtown parking, period. <laughs> okay. Yeah. On my right. Not, not to walk on street. Okay. This yeah. is to yeah. walk on. Yeah. Mr. Moderator, Brian Herr, uh, one member of the select board. With this separation uh, comes a little bit of a change in the dynamic of any negotiations that may have taken place with the select board and the landowners. Uh, and without getting into executive session uh, content, I stand in favor of the separation one, obviously, but item one, 6 Walcott Street, would have been on my list as I negotiated this thing had we stayed with the prior approach. Um, so I support 6 Walcott Street. It makes all the sense in the world. It's directly connected to Town Hall. It gives us that access in and out, and um, it makes, uh, I think, a lot of sense to move forward with this one. I'll be back to the microphone to perhaps share some more negotiation thoughts I had about the other stuff on the other two. Thank you. Okay. On my left. Mr. Moderator, Greg Mazur, 10 Jamie Lane. Uh, my wife and I also own 42 Main Street, 3036 Main Street, 5 Walcott and 7 Walcott. Um, we took uh, a better part of four years to redevelop that space down there. Uh, in fact, it took us uh, over two years to um, facilitate a restaurant, uh, which is Central Public House, coming to that space. Uh, one of our primary uh, objections from all the restaurants that we talked to over that two-year period was, your town has no parking. So I'm in favor of the parking at 6 Walcott, as well as the others, because um, quite frankly, without it, um, we will, with the downtown corridor project, we will have um, some deaths in the family with regards to the small uh, uh, businesses. I'd like you to read, uh, read something quickly from the 2017, somebody, one of the speakers was asking for some study. Uh, we do a lot of studies here. Um, this one was actually done uh, 2017, Town of Hopkinton Master Plan. So the town was involved in doing this. Uh, page 49, uh, number 10, creates sufficient, it, it, it's, it's in a section that's labeled action plan. And number 10 is create sufficient parking in the downtown to meet demand. There is a dire need for more parking in the downtown area. There have been shared parking solutions, including the lease with St. John's, the Evangelist Church, to handle overflow for the expanded public library. The town wants an exciting and vibrant downtown with restaurants or even a food destination along Main Street, perhaps a brew pub, ethnic restaurants. Without sufficient parking, such ideas will never come to fruition and downtown could languish. The okay, town should I, let, me, let me so let me cut so you off. I, I strongly Specific urge to, to this one. Count. I strongly urge because the town does not have any parking. They are infringing upon uh, Bill's Pizza, and uh, yes, it's going to cost us some money, but it's time. On my right. Good evening, sir. My name is Joe Marquardt. I happen to own Six Walcott Street. Have been there since 1985, running a survey engineering business. We have prepared plans, which Mr. Kamalo has seen, that shows 31 parking spaces 
with all of the grading that needs to be done to make this a parking lot. As everyone has said, we abut the town hall. And this is an ideal spot for the town to take advantage of this. I will also tell you that I have been talking to selectmen, town managers, executive secretaries since 1990 about doing this. It has never got to this point with all of the folks that I have talked to. I am now ready to sell. If you're interested, let's do it. <laughs> On my left. Ken Weiss, Mantle 145 Ash Street. The three properties that are here are the best three properties for downtown parking. These will, three, all three of them will work. Second of all, I re, the parking is really needed now. Once we start this construction in a year, it's going to be a mess, and without these additional spots, <clears throat> the mess is even going to be worse. Third is part of the construction process on Main Street is to improve the drainage. And the cost of particular Mr. Joseph's approval or project could be significantly reduced if more drainage was allowed to come out onto Main Street. The same with these other ones too, to solve the drainage problems and reduce town costs. And I believe the state is picking up the drainage uh, structures that are going to go there. And originally, there was some plans to make sure that they were sized big enough to handle the adjacent properties. And th fourth thing I'd like to say about uh, number six, Walcott Street, I believe that building was built in 1920. It will be subject to a potential demolition <laughs> delay, but I don't think it's quite that historic, but you never know. Thank you. On my right. Dave Ball, Meadowland Drive. So my first point is that I think the town hall is becoming a money pit. Um, we, we, we had a flooding thing. We spent a lot of money. We're on talking that. about Six I, I am, Walcott I am, Street. I am talking to that as well. Well, um, let's talk exclusively to that because it's 10 of 11. <laughs> I, I want to explain my rationale, if I may. So we just approved 200,000 for the basement earlier in this town meeting, and we're looking at. Oh, we brought it down. Okay, but it came up, and uh, another. This is another 500,000. So what I would like to suggest is. Um, why don't we level the center school and build a new town hall there at some point? We're just, just, I know it's kind of drastic, but I just want to uh, think outside a, the box. It's out of order. We're okay. going to move to the left. So hold on. I just have another point. You said I wait in line for a, a motion, an amendment, sorry. So um, I would like to ask the town if they plan on using eminent domain for number one. Mr. Mr. Attorney Miaris. So uh, the parcel at um, 6 Walcott Street is, um, uh, is the subject of ongoing negotiations. Uh, we expect that if the town meeting approves this one, it is a unique parcel, so it doesn't have to go through any RFP process. If we negotiate a purchase and sale agreement, it will all be entirely voluntary, obviously. Both sides have to sign. Now, you asked, though, uh, do we have, uh, would we consider going through the eminent domain process? And what, what I'm going to tell you is, even if we ex, uh, execute a purchase and sale agreement that's entirely voluntary, my recommendation to the town will be that we treat that agreement as a damages agreement. We'll talk about the damages agreement in a little while. But what that means is we take the property by eminent domain, but we've already, before we even do it, have agreed on what the compensation will be. And the reason we want to do that is it saves the town a little money because we don't have to get um, title insurance when we, execute, we take the property by eminent domain. All competing claims to the property are extinguished. So we get a better product if we, if we execute, uh, if we do it um, by eminent domain and that would be something that the property owner would have to agree to. And, and so we probably would do that. Thank you, that's a good explanation. My, my amendment was going to be to remove the word eminent domain, but I, I, I will withdraw that now. On my left. Bernie Mitchell, 5 Claflin Street. 
uh, downtown parking has always been an issue that has come up over the last 15 years. We've had um, various landowners that have been willing to share parking. One of them is the old Colellers. Uh, on a Friday and Thursday night, where you might think there are no parking spaces, but from two very active businesses, it's 50 feet, we'll call it 30 yards, to walk to the front doors of any of those spaces. So the need may be a little overstated, and um, we have parking here at the old Colellas. There's parking on the street. Center School is not in activity any longer, so you have parking up there. Of course, you have Center School parking. Uh, on Hayden Road Street, there's parking available now that the teachers aren't parking there. And then behind the school, there's parking. There's also spaces at St. John's that the town uses now. That was my first point. Second point was drainage was brought up. And uh, what about the people downstream from these parking facilities, specifically where the water will run off of, from Six Walcott or from behind bills into the neighborhood? And if you're in that neighborhood, you might remember a house that was in Framingham that was condemned because the water runoff from a parking lot changed their basement and would not stop flowing in their, <clears throat> in their yard. Excuse me. Thank you. On my right? Barry Rosenblum, 10 Briar Cliff. This article um, cost uh, half a million dollars for 32 spaces, correct? This is just acquiring the land. Ms. Wright? Article sub, sub paragraph one. Yes. Right? The request is to acquire the land. It does not include construction. So there's another half a million dollars approximately to finish uh, the, the parking spaces, which is equivalent to the uh, across the street parcel for Mr. Joseph. That's that, another 32. That, yeah, that has not been determined. I can give you an example. When we expanded the parking lot at the senior center, um, the cost was around 6,000 per parking space. When we did the six parking spaces in front of the police station, because of environmental issues, the cost was around 14,000 per parking space. So my, my point, I guess, is if you're going to acquire the land in this article, do you have to wait another year for another town meeting to acquire the construction cost? Or are you going to be sitting with a piece of land for a year? Correct. Except, except a portion of Six Wall Court is already paved and is used as parking already. So does anybody want to amend this to include the construction cost uh, estimate? <laughs> no. <laughs> On my left. Mr. Moderator, Joe Markey, 39 out of Ash Street. I'd like to uh, move the question. Okay. Is there a second? All right. Uh, all those in favor of moving the question, which is, which is to say ending debate on 30, uh, 51, number one, signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay. So debate is ended on uh, the consideration of the purchase of 6 Walcott Street. This requires a two-thirds vote. All those, and, and also will require a vote at, uh, at the ballot on May 20. All those in favor, rise and hold up your yellow card. I can presume it's not going to be unanimous. Fourteen on the stage.
Mr. Moderator, Center Front 31. Center Front 31. Center Rear 35. Center Rear 35. On the right, 48. 48 on the right. Left Front 29. Left Front 29. Left Rear 49. Left Rear 49, okay. All those opposed, please rise and hold up your cards. Two oh six. One on the stage. Center rear six. Center rear six. Center front five. Center front five. Left rear two. Left rear two. Left front seven. On the right, 11. Left front seven, on the right, 11. 32. 206 in favor, 32 opposed, and so it passes. Okay, now we're moving on to item two within Article 51. Claire, would you again explain which parcel this is? It's been a long time. Okay, so we are talking about Mr. Joseph's parcel that he just spoke to us about. This okay. is land between 25 and 35 Main Street. I'm sorry, I, I misspoke, I had it backwards. We, uh, the price we're talking about is, is um, for the construction. Mr. Joseph is kindly donating the land um, and it will again provide about 32, 31, 32 spaces. Is there discussion on this? Mr. Moderator, Ed Harrow, 8 Spring Lane. There is clearly a need for parking in downtown Hopkinton and I congratulate all the parties involved for thinking through this. There is, however, an elephant in the room, and that is the plan for, I hesitate to use the word bike lane because it's not part of the four corners of the article, but there is this plan for bike lane, and at the steepest part of the gradient in that bike lane, we are now going to put in two active driveways. Very, very, very bad idea. On my left. Nanda Barker Hook, 75 Grove Street. I was wondering if this vote will impact the development, the whole overall plan, and if so, what the impact would be. The development of what? Um, Mr. Joseph's entire plan for that property. I, th I think he indicated that, that his planning already anticipated that uh, the town might approve this parking. Uh, yeah, he, Mr. Joseph brought this to us as part of his plan, so he's, he's on board with it. I, I understand, I, I just wonder if it's voted no versus yes, how is that gonna impact the rest of his plan? Will in, it make, in other words, will, it there, will there be a change to yeah. his development if this does not pass? Right, yes. Uh, Chuck, could you address that? <clears throat> yeah, the reason we're in front of the town meeting right now is that we plan on going to the planning board very soon. If the parking lot is not approved, it would impact what we do. Um, clearly, we wouldn't, I mean, just the drainage structures alone would be completely different. On my right. Mr. Moderator, Brian Herr. Um, so with the passage of of uh, item one, the parking at 6 Walcott Street, or the proposed parking at 6 Walcott Street. That now um, shifts us to a different sort of mindset as we thought through this whole process of negotiating to find additional parking for downtown Hopkinton. So with this parcel here and this opportunity here, this then puts, so 6 Walcott is over here on the north side of Main Street. 
This parcel over here is on the south side of Main Street. It's about the same number of parking spots additional as would, been, would have been 6 Walcott. So there's a lot of synergy there. With this parcel here, moving forward and passing here tonight and passing at the ballot, in my mind as one member of the, of the select board, I'm working on that habit, with one member of the select board, that ends it for me. I'm good. We have parking on the south side. We have parking on the north side or future parking on the south side and north side. We create a lot of safety for people parking. They're not crossing back and forth on the street. And that would end uh, my advocacy for any additional parking in downtown Hoppington. I hope the town meeting members support this parcel for parking. And then we call it a day. Thank you. On my left. William Simpson, Mr. Moderator. I move at this point that we shut down for the night and start again tomorrow with this business. And if not, why does uh, 30 parking spaces on donated land cost half a million dollars to grade and compact and pave? That seems kind of strange too. And also, the thing about the bicycle path going through that, that should be looked at too. Claire, any, any comment on cost? Or Mr. Kamalo? Um, to the resident asking the question, th thank you so much. Um, in our conversations with Chuck, uh, we've been very clear that based on past practice, we will look very closely at the invoices that he submits to support the price that he names. Um, we have done this in the past. You may recall uh, that Legacy Farms was responsible for constructing uh, the well, Aprila Farms well. At the time we were presented with the bills for that well, we did a very detailed thorough review of the cost and we'll do the same with this project. On my right. Barry Rosenblum, 10 Briarcliff. Uh, I'm in favor of acquiring number two. Uh, I have a couple of questions or points. One, one is, do we need to accept the donation first of the land? And number two, the wording seems like it's acquisition-based rather than um, surface preparation cost. Attorney Meares. Sounds like I need to speak to Norman before I speak. Okay, so the state procurement laws require that anytime that we buy land, with a few exceptions, anytime that we buy land, that we can't just go out and buy it, we have to issue an RFP. We have to say what it is that we want, and then we have to give anybody the opportunity to offer their land and to, and to a bid a price. With respect to um, the uh, 6 Walcott Street, it comes under an exception to that rule because it is what's known as a unique parcel. And the reason it's a unique parcel is because we're acquiring land for uh, uh, parking at Town Hall, and this is uniquely available for that purpose because it's adjacent to Town Hall. So we are, we are able to um, enter into negotiations directly. The other two parcels, because the number two and number three, um, both have to be selected pursuant to an RFP process. And so after town meeting votes, uh, we will in fact have to go out to a town meeting process. Um, the, um, we are not obligated to pick the lowest cost. We are obligated, however, to specify what our evaluation criteria will be. Uh, it is my expectation that uh, the, the RFP will um, 
uh, will uh, provide an advantage for a, um, a seller who is going to uh, de develop the parking and um, submit their, uh, their totals to us. Um, the, it, as a matter of a legal form, however, what we are doing is we are buying the land for the cost of the, uh, the bare land plus the cost of the improvement. So uh, in this case, Mr. Joseph is specifying that the cost of the land is going to be zero, and the, all we're going to have to pay for is the cost of the improvement. Uh, but it should be clear that, that we are authorizing the acquisition of the land and paying this money as part of that acquisition. Thank you. My left. Lucia Lopez for Marshall Ave. I um, oppose passing Article 2 given, or the second section of this article, given that we've passed the first. Um, we have just agreed to purchase 30 to 32 from what was mentioned parking spaces for about 16 to $17,000, and that's just for the land. That does not include the construction costs from what they've told us. So we will be spending additional money to build the parking lot for the town hall um, because we will now have these additional 30 to 32 spaces in downtown once the land is purchased and the lots are built. I do not see a need for purchasing another 30 to 32 spaces to the tune of 16, 17. How we spend about $15,000 per pupil um, every year. We've talked about our police and fire department, where they are now going through a feasibility, feasibility study to see if they need to expand uh, their services because our town is growing and it will continue to grow. And rather than spending $540,000 on 30 to 32 additional parking spaces, I say we allow the town, now that we have agreed to, to see how much more money they're going to need to construct those 30 to 32 parking spaces on 6 Walcott. And hopefully that will alleviate the problem. Um, I disagree that there is a problem. Since Mr. Joseph brought this to the select board, I have made it a point every time I walk and drive into downtown to look at the parking spaces. And the first time I did it, I started counting empty parking spaces. and. I stopped at about 20 something. Um, I started on West Main going down into the center of town. I was going to the library. I had not gotten to 2535 yet when I stopped counting because I got tired of counting and I thought if there are 20 some spaces, there isn't a need. I do this every time I go either to Bills or Pants High or the library. If I remember, um, I am an urban planner by training, so it's just something that I'm trained to do when I wonder if there's a problem, I need an answer. Um, and in this case, I haven't found it to be a problem. On Marathon Weekend, I went Saturday for lunch. They had roped off parking spaces in front of the library for large charter buses to come in with Marathon tours. So there wasn't parking there because those were roped off. There were empty spaces on Main Street in front of Bills, in front of 2535 Main Street. I understand that we enjoy convenience, but Thank you. I would suggest that we save some money. Thank you. How are you doing, uh, Brian Brown, 12 uh, Bowker Road? Um, I first need to know when she's going downtown. <coughs> Completely different than my experience. Anyway, uh, so I have, uh, I have three kids under five years old. Uh, so I'm probably the only one in the room that loves town meetings. It's like vacation for me. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, but to that point, um, I love, I, I, I'm a big proponent of all three of these, uh, especially this one. Uh, Mr. Hurst stole my thunder a little bit. It's the only one uh, on the same side as the library that the town invested $12 million in. And, uh, and my kids and all your kids uh, can use now. So thank you very much. That's thank you. 
Uh, Amy Ritterbush, 54 Grove Street, speaking as the chair of the Historic District Commission. I did just want to mention that the Historic District Commission did review this project in February and issued a certificate of appropriateness because there's not any changes to the exterior architectural features. We issued, we, um, we imposed several conditions and he's going to come back to us when the project is further along. But none of the parking spots will be in front of the building. He's reducing it from three driveways to two and we issued a certificate of appropriateness with conditions. Thank you. Okay, seeing that there's no more discussion, we're ready for a vote on Article 51, the second element, <clears throat> which is the acquisition of land for $540,000 at 25 and 35 Main Street. All those in favor, please rise and hold your yellow cards up. It was an acquisition, though, was it? Fifteen on the stage. Mr. Moderator, center front 30. Center front 30. Center rear 31. Center rear 31. On the right, 52. 52 on the right. Left front 27. Left front 27. Left rear 42. Left rear 42. And those opposed, please rise. Center front three. Center front three. On the right, three. Three on the right. <laughs> None on the stage. On the left, rear three. Left, rear three. Left, front four. Left, front four. Center, rear six. Six, okay. 19. 197 in favor, 19 opposed. It passes the two-thirds majority. Okay, so we're, we're now going to move to discussion of 31, uh, excuse me, Article 51, Item 3. Claire has a clarifying point. I, I simply want to clarify that because we have voted for the six Walcott purchase and for the um, 2535, but if we are, are in opposition to the larger parcel, the 10 to 14, the vote of the town meeting stands. So when you go to the ballot on the 20th, there are four ballot questions. Question three pertains to Walcott Street but question four pertains to the two municipal parcels. I don't recall the wording, Connor might recall, I don't know if they're spelled out, but 
we can know that voting yes on question four does not allow the purchase, will not allow the purchase of the larger parcel it, that this town meeting rejects. It may appear both articles are on question four, but if we're voting only for 25, 35 or that type or that amount of money, um, the larger parcel well, will not be part of that. You know what, I'll clarify that as we get through the okay. vote on, on three. Okay. So is there a discussion on the third element, which is the, uh, the, the 10 Walcott Street and 14 Main Street for 1.56 million? Mr. Hyman. Yes, Mark Hyman, 12 Hidden Brick. Um, I understood from um, Select Board Member Hur's comment earlier that the Select Board may no longer be in favor of this last point. Are I you still that, moving this point of the motion? I think that was an individual comment. I, I'm asking the question of the Select Board generally. Are they withdrawing this motion or still proposing it? Mr. Moderator, I cannot speak on behalf of the Select Board. Uh, I can only speak on behalf of myself. And what I said was, if the first two passed, which they did, I would no longer support this one. I can't answer for my colleagues. And I'll ask the chair. Why? Well, I would believe we're something to be voted on. It, it's to be voted. I don't know we that we need well to take, take an indiv vote. individual polling. I mean, you'll, you'll see them, we'll as we take a vote, indicate. Clear. Right, so the select board is still moving this, this point of the article. Yes. Thank you. Bernie Mitchell, 5 Claflin Street. Could we put up the map of the parcel? <clears throat> uh, are we looking for the uh, parcel in total or in part? Claire, which part is it? Just five. element 10? 10, everything in yellow? Yes. Okay. Any estimate on what it would be to improve it, to put in a parking space? 1.5 to buy it, how much to improve? We don't have that number yet. Okay, uh, it's been around for a while. Is there any estimate that you can give the, the, uh, the town meeting? It's, that's pretty, pretty dangerous. Yeah. It's, it's pretty dangerous to, to just ballpark something. Okay, so um, 184 spaces in this parcel. Um, Can you clarify the number of spaces that would be? No, no, this parcel would provide 120 spaces. The parcel is 34,000 square feet and may produce 120. Okay, so 120. 184 was the total with all three. Thank you. And 1.5 for the purchase and unknown for the improvement. I can't. Yes. Are, so are, are you in favor? Or? I am not in favor. Thank you. On my right. Rafan Asrula, select board member. Um, I think with the approval of the previous two parcels, that gets us to about 70, par 70 parking spaces. Uh, I think that's plenty. And I would not be in favor of uh, going for additional parking. On my left. Ron Foisey, 25 Chamberlain Street. I rise in support of this article as well. Just a point of information, uh, town hall employees have approximately how many people reporting for work every day? Around 30? Would that be a reasonable number? Over 30. Pardon? It's over 30 over 30 and we've just approved 30 parking spaces on the municipal side of things so when everybody's at work we've added zero additional parking spaces to downtown the other advantage of this particular location is that we would not necessarily have to develop the entire parcel today but put in 30 to 50 spaces at at one time and allow for the additional growth that we're projecting as Hoppington becomes fully built out over the next 10 or 20 years, we would still have a space to expand parking down the road. On my right. Hi, Jim Cirillo, 35 Wood Street. I have a question, uh, and the question is this. Art, this uh, sub-article three says $1,560,000. 
that is for leasing the property, is that correct? Not for purchasing, because I assume we're not purchasing Bill's restaurant and the Bill's property, and we're not uh, purchasing the Masonic, any of that stuff, right? So this is for Mr. leasing. No, Mr. Kamala? Yeah. That number refers to a purchase. This and number refers list. to a purchase of all three parcels? The article includes three parcels of land, 10 Walcott plus two others. Th that is correct. It's a portion of the front bills parcel, which is also, there's also a portion of 10 Walcott Street, and there's also a portion of the parcels that I believe bills either bought from the Masons or from the Korean church. Follow up, please, Mr. Moderator. Go ahead. This doesn't say that. This implies that by gift, purchase, lease, etc., these three parcels in their entirety are part of this article. Consisting so of portions of properties. So it's it, you can trust that what's being represented to you is correctly written in the article. It, it does not include a purchase of bills or of his parking, but of other elements of his parcel and other parcels. Okay, I'll say that I'm very uncomfortable because while it may appear to some to describe exactly what we're doing, it is not clear to me what we're doing, and I think there's maybe others that it's not clear to. Thank you. On my left. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Tom Terry from 17 Maple Street. Um, we are discussing this under the presumption that the selectmen are in favor. Is that true? Uh, based upon their vote before the meeting, yes. yes. Would it be proper to let them take 60 seconds to caucus? Because we've heard from two people who have said they're against it. Uh, it's possible that all five are against it, and we're, we're, uh, if we trust our selectmen's wisdom, uh, maybe we should listen to it since it doesn't seem, I'd like to have it affirmed that they're still in favor. Thank you. Claire, it's up to you. Well, we can take an informal caucus, but when we made the vote, it was that the parcels were worthy of consideration and we should put this to the townspeople as to whether they wanted to authorize these funds to let the selectmen or, or the uh, town manager move forward to negotiate for them. It wasn't, um, it, it was to put it forward to the people because we felt it was a worthwhile consideration. On my right. Uh, Ken Parker, 69 Clinton Street. I have a question. If, if, I, I think I'm opposed to buying this parcel, but the only, uh, possibly I'd be in favor if we bought the parcel and then perhaps we could sell parcel, a part of it off for a hefty sum to some developer or maybe we could use another town usage of it. I don't know. Uh, also, if we do not buy it, is there a possibility some somebody might uh, decide to buy the land and then build something that we would not like? Are those considerations that we should be taking into, uh, into account in deciding what we should be doing right now? That's my yes. question. Those are considerations. But we could sell part of it even if we decided to buy more parking lots, we could, we could buy a few more parking lots and then sell off the rest if we wanted to, right? Anything is possible. Fewer things are possible at 11.30 at night, however. <laughs> On my left. Ken Weiss, Mantle, 145 Ash Street. I'd like to remind town meeting that our downtown parking requirements, you count out the, the number of parking space needed based on the restaurant use or retail use, and then you divide it by half, and that's what gets permitted in, during site plan review. So basically, a new development downtown only has to provide half of the parking that statistically they, they, they will need. So basically, if you're going to redevelop any of the other places downtown, they're going to need more parking than the 30 
on one side and the 30 on the other. Now, to amplify on the point that Mr. Parker just made, this is zoned downtown business, and you could have an apartment complex similar to what Paul was proposing on this property. You could have a condo project. It's the only place where condos other than legacy farms are allowed via our zoning at this particular time. You could have a downtown business facing Walcott Street with their frontage. That's permitted by our zoning at in, in this point. You will not be, by voting down this, you will not be voting to keep it as a woods or area. It might be better for the people on uh, Claflin Street to have the town as a sensitive developer that would screen that area from there. Uh, they might be better off long term than many of the other uses that could be proposed there. And maybe now Bills has decided that they're interested in selling this property and it might just go on the market more fully. On my right? I've already spoken, Mr. Moderator. Okay. I don't know if they on have. my left, then? Alton Chen, 3 Nicholas Road. Recommend that we move the question. Okay. Is there a second? Wait. Is there a second? Okay. The motion has been made to end debate on this. <clears throat> All those in favor of ending debate signify by saying aye. aye. Any opposed? So that's a clear majority. We're ready to take a vote on Article 51, Item 3. Let's try by voice vote to start. All those in favor of Item 3 signify by saying aye. aye. All those opposed? No. Okay, we need to stand. If you're in favor, please stand and raise your yellow card. Mr. Moderator. Five on the stage. Left front, five. Left, hold on a second. Left front, five. Center rear, four. Center rear, four. 23 on the right. 23 on the right. Center front, 19. 19 center front. Left rear, 23. Left rear, 23. All those opposed, please rise. Eleven on the stage. Center front, 10. Center front, 10. Center rear, 29. Center rear, 29. Right rear, 19. Right rear, 19. On the right, 36. Left front, 22. The, the right was how many? Was it 26, Mary Jo? 36. 36.
127. Okay. Sorry, Mr. Moderator. We, I think she misspoke. It, it was the left that was 19. Yes, got it. So it's uh, 79 in favor, 127 opposed. It fails. Okay, only a few more to go. Article 52. Ms. Wright. Article 52, I move in order to stay within the Mass DOT process that the town take no action on Article 52. So the board has indicated that it wishes to take, that, that it's recommending that we take no action with respect to Article 52. No action? Is there discussion? Do you, do you need clarification as to why the board is recommending yes. that? I, I would defer to town council, please. Attorney Mieris. For an explanation. Okay, I'm sorry that this is a long explanation. I'm sorry that I'm starting it at uh, 1130, but I'll try to move through it as quickly as I can. So whenever you have a new road project at the uh, somewhere in the process you have to lay out the public way. So what that means is a, this is a process that we do all the time, every year. We have, we did it earlier today, we voted to lay out um, uh, a couple of subdivision roads and, so that they can become public ways. And there is a process for that. And it's set forth in statute and it has four steps. First, the Board of Selectmen has to vote to lay out the public way. Second, they have to give notice to all the property owners who are abutting on the property way. Third, the town meeting votes. And then fourth, we have to acquire all of the uh, interests in land in order to uh, make the properties um, a part of the prop public way. And that all, that fourth process has to happen within 120 days of the town meeting vote. So this should be familiar because we do it every year. Um, uh, when the town meeting voted last year uh, to acquire various easements for the downtown Carter project, it authorized the acquisition for, of easements for the purpose of laying out the roads, but it did not authorize the laying out of the roads. The idea was that the actual laying out um, might occur um, either before or after the easements were acquired, and we were deferring to uh, uh, Mass Dot, Massachusetts Department of Transportation, um, for guidance as to how we should proceed. Um, by, uh, by 2019, it has now become clear that Mass Dot is expecting the town to lay out the way after all the easements are acquired and construction of the project is complete. But at the time that the warrant was put together, it was not yet co clear what was going to uh, be required. So that's the reason we put it on, um, on the warrant at the time. The, um, um, such, so that in case it turned out that MassDOT would require a fresh vote so that before we could acquire um, the easements to trigger a new 120 day period, we would be prepared to do it. The article was placed on the warrant really as a, as a contingency while we tried to work on MassDOT to uh, be clear. Since then, we have now gotten better clarity from MassDOT as to what, uh, what they required. And um, what they uh, say is, the town of Hopkinton should refer this question to town council. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So it doesn't matter anymore what MassDOT thinks. It only matters what I think. And so I, we, our office has spent um, uh, a good amount of time feverishly pursuing this question, trying to get some guidance from the Department of Revenue, who respectfully declined to give us any. Um, 
And so I'm going to tell you that I have interpreted section 24 of Mass General Law chapter, chapter 82 to require um, uh, the 120-day 100 period to uh, start uh, at the time that town meeting votes to lay out the right of way. That will probably happen in a couple of years. So the 120-day period doesn't start to run until then. At that time, um, uh, that, uh, we will need to, uh, uh, by then we will have already acquired all of the easements. So uh, that is why no action is needed tonight. Um, what you need to understand is that there are two processes. We've just talked about the, the, the one that uh, applies to all public ways. There is a second process. <laughs> Because this is a federally funded project, we have to follow a whole lot of um, special rules uh, to comply uh, with the federally uh, mandated uh, practices. Um, and we have to submit e records of everything that we do to MassDOT, and MassDOT has to bless it. So um, those processes mean that each of the individual property owners needs to be contacted. We have to attempt to meet with each one individually, um, and we need to attempt to reach agreement on the specific terms of each easement. And by that, we mean specifically uh, the length for, for temporary easements, the length of the term. It must be at least three years. Um, it has been recommended that we go for five years in case bad things happen along the way and it turns out we don't finish the project in time. Uh, or because we have to go back and clean up something that, that, um, uh, uh, that goes wrong along the way. Um, and another thing that we will need to negotiate with each person is pinpointing the area where utility c uh, connections are needed. Right now we have um, specified the easement area to be the entire front yard of each each building because we have not been inside the buildings we don't know where the electric um, uh, connections need to be so um, once we have the individual conversations we'll be able to narrow down the easements um, uh, and um, if um, property owner is of course always free to donate these easements to us but if they um, don't do it uh, we are required by uh, MassDOT to provide them with an appraisal. Um, and uh, then on the basis of all that, there are four possible outcomes. Outcome number one is that after seeing the appraisal, the property owner agrees to donate the, the easement. Outcome number two is that we enter into a purchase and sale agreement um, uh, based on the appraisal and, and the property owner uh, conveys the easement to us. Uh, option three is uh, we enter into a damages agreement. We talked about this a minute ago about, uh, about the advantage to the, the town of, of uh, acquiring the land by eminent domain subject to a damages agreement where the amount of the payment will be, um, uh, will be agreed upon. And if no agreement is reached, then the town will have to decide, A, whether it want, can modify the project to work around the, the property owner who does not wish to agree, um, B, whether it um, is, makes sense simply to abandon the whole project because of the, um, the recalcitrant uh, uh, property owner, or C, uh, whether we want to uh, exercise the power of eminent domain um, in order to take the property and uh, pay just compensation as the Constitution requires. Um, the uh, letters that were sent out uh, a little while ago were um, uh, sent to affected property owners that were intended to update them on the status of the project and the potential um, next steps. Um, the letter was sent now rather than, say, last year mm -hmm. because the project has only just recently uh, received 75% uh, design. Um, that 75% design has been submitted to MassDOT um, and um, 
uh, we're waiting for MassDOT to approve it. We can't really go much further with the easements until we have that approval from MassDOT. So um, there was going to be a lot of activity from here on in, but there is no additional vote beyond what was taken last year uh, uh, needed, and so no action is the appropriate motion tonight. And just to clarify, whether um, this meeting votes in favor or uh, opposed, it really has no effect. Is that the true? The town has all the authorization it needs it already needs from last point. year. Okay. So while I will allow some discussion, uh, you do need to understand that any action we take on this article tonight is moot. With that on my right. Jackie Potenzoni, 12 Wood Street. I stand here as a member of the Downtown Initiative Civic Group. I refer all my fellow citizens to look at your Hopkinton Annual Report, page three. I was actually uh, sworn in to that group after the first vote failed a town meeting. And that was going to be created. So there was more transparency to this project. I have never been invited to a meeting. There was two members on the group, and not all of you were on the Board of Selectmen when this happened, so that's why I want to bring this to your attention, that I'm requesting the Board of Selectmen that we reconvene that group, get more downtown members to be part of the group. There's a Chamber of Commerce position open, there's two residential positions open, and I think that residents should be able to be part of the the, the um, process. I asked to be the business representative on the group. My name is in the annual report. If you could please reopen this group that we can actually have communication. I was told that I was out of the scope of the plan at that 75% design. My home was not on the plan. I had a meeting with the town manager, the town engineer, um, Lane and John Westerlane. They assured me, my neighbors Derek and Lindsay were there, that I wasn't on the scope of the plan. But I was totally blindsided when I got that piece of paper. And you all know I was a very active opponent to the plan because of how it was affecting my house. So when we did get that plan, I couldn't believe that letter of donation, I couldn't believe it. Because you assured me, and I wasn't on the map at the 75% design. So why, why was I on it now? I want to ask this new Board of Selectmen that wasn't in power, I think Brian was. I think, yeah, you were, yeah. You were there, Brian. And I want community involvement. Because we are citizens, we have our rights. The downtown <clears throat> corridor plan is doing everything to take away our rights as citizens and homeowners. We are paying the price for revitalization. And uh, the whole time I've had to fight. Sometimes I felt like it was a one woman fight. But now there's over 90 homes being affected. And I started protesting in 2011 because I got a call from a customer telling me to look on hot news. Your house is on there. You need to know what's going on. And that's what took me to the streets. Okay. There's no transparency. Thank there you. hasn't been from the day this plan started. Thank you. Please. Please. Again, you know, we'll, we'll take one or two more, recognizing that any vote taken on this tonight is a moot vote. On my left. Mr. Moderator, Joe Markey, 39 Ash Street. Uh, I have a question seeking clarification on what, uh, right now are we discussing the motion to take no action? Is that what the discussion is? So that you're looking for pros we're, and cons and taking no action? We're, we're discussing the article itself. The, the Board of Selectmen has made its recommendation to the meeting to take no action, but we're discussing the, the, the article. Thank you. On my right. Um, Paula McSweeney, I own property at 16 Wood Street that I believe part of my property is in this, but I never received notice. My son is 14 Wood Street. He's never received notice. So I'm just kind of wondering 
This I just heard about it from my neighbor <laughs> of this whole. I, I think you'd have to. Who would I raise that question either with the okay. with the town manager or? Okay. All right. All right. Thank you. On my left, Ken Weissman, 145 Ash Street. I call the question. Is there a second? Second. second. All those in favor of ending discussion? Aye. Any opposed? No. No. And it's uh, it it we voted to end discussion. So now we're voting on Article 52. Uh, the, the motion is to take no action. So if you vote to take no action, no action will be taken. If you, <laughs> if you vote against taking no action, nothing's going to happen anyway. So all those in favor of taking no action signify by saying aye. Aye. All those in favor of not taking no action, say nay. It's unanimous. No action will be taken. We've already considered Article 53. Article 54, Ms. Wright. The Board of Selectmen moves the article as written in the um, article and motions document. Board of Selectmen recommends approval. If and I is there any explanation? Just very quickly, this is a simple housekeeping article pertaining to the Middlesex Vogue uh, Regional School District. Uh, please, if you're if you're in the hall, okay. please stay. We, we've got five minutes at most. This, Let's not disrupt the discussion. The article amends the agreement between the f towns of Ashland, Hollis, and Hoppington, Nittick, and Framingham regarding the establishment of the regional vocational school district. As I said, it is a housekeeping article. It incorporates prior amendments that have been passed. It eliminates outdated provisions. It recognizes Framingham's move from a town to a city and it brings the agreement in line with the existing district practices. So it's a ministerial... Exactly. Okay. Seeing no discussion, all those in favor of Article 54 as proposed signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? Unanimous and so voted. Article 55, sponsor is trustees of the school fund. Is there a trustee present? Mr. Moderator, I'll keep this very brief. Um, my name is Nancy Legassi. I'm the chairman of the trustees of the school fund, and we are currently operating with five members, which is our minimum for a quorum. We've had three volunteers <clears> step <throat> forward who would like to become trustees, and we would ask that you would approve them. Uh, and you, you need to move the motion. Uh, could we move the motion as it's, as it's written? I think that would be acceptable. Thank you. Good night. <laughs> are there any questions? Uh, is, is there a second? second? Okay. Any questions? Hearing none, all those in favor of the article signify by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed? And it's unanimous and so voted. Okay. Before we take the final motion, I want to um, extend some thanks. First to the deputy moderator and to all of the counters under her direction for their work over the past three nights. To the town clerk. To the town manager, to the town land use director, to the board of selectmen, to the planning board, to capital improvements, to appropriations, to town council, to HCAM, and anyone else whom I may have missed. Um, the effort, as you can imagine, that goes on behind the scenes and during the meetings is uh, extraordinary, and much of it is uh, provided by volunteers and they deserve our hearty thanks. And I will allow a round of applause at this point. <laughs> and I, of course, extend uh, my appreciation for all of you who came and participated. With that, there is a final motion. Ms. Wright. We move that the annual town meeting adjourn until the date of the annual town election, May 20, 2019, held at the Hoffington Middle School Gymnasium, and further, that the annual town meeting shall be dissolved upon the close of the polls on the date of the annual town election. All those in favor? Wait, I second it. I second it. I second. Yeah, second. <laughs> Doesn't need to be seconded. All those opposed? It's unanimous and so voted. Oh. Thank you very much. <laughs> Oh boy, okay, Norman, how many turns?